everybody. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the June 12th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Friend? Here. And I uh, would like to ask you to join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. And for the moment of silence, we'd just like to acknowledge uh, that Mr. Palacios isn't here today because his mother passed away yesterday. So if you could please keep her and him in your thoughts today. She was a remarkable woman, and as you all know, Mr. Palacios is quite a remarkable person, and I think his mom had a large role in that, so please keep him in your thoughts. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands uh, good morning, Ms. Coburn. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, there are. So on the consent agenda, item 26, there is a correction. The item should read, with nominations for appointment to be received on June 26 of 2018. Item 46, there are additional materials. There's a revised attachment B packet page 540. There are clean and strike, strike out underlying copies. There's also an addenda to the consent agenda. There's item 74.1, which is to defer the public hearing to consider designating the Silver Ranch Barn in Aptos, assessor's parcel number 107-361-09 as a locally significant historic resource from June 12th to June 26, 2018 is recommended by the planning director and there's a board memo printout. On the regular agenda, item 85, there are additional materials. There's a revised attachment A, packet pages 1176 through 1184 and there are clean and strikeout underlying copies. Thank you for that. Good morning, Supervisor Caput. Are there any items you'd like to briefly comment on or pull from the consent agenda? I'll briefly uh, comment on a few, uh, and there, I'll do it quickly. Uh, with uh, item uh, 16, uh, it makes sense. Uh, it would be uh, annexing the uh, Atkinson Lane Pippin uh, affordable housing project. Uh, to the city of Watsonville. It's county land surrounded by the city of Watsonville. All of the uh, services uh, would be provided by the city of Watsonville. Uh, that would be police, fire, uh, water, and uh, sewage, and all that. So it makes sense for the 46 units of affordable housing that'll be going in there. and. Uh, uh, it's uh, county land surrounded by the city, so it wouldn't make sense to have Cal Fire have to report there and also uh, the sheriffs having to go through city limits in order to get to the Pippin apartments. So uh, that'll be a good thing to see. Uh, number 18 is uh, a year-round uh, sheltering. Right now, the Salvation Army is uh, taking over the winter sheltering of homeless. and. Um, It'll be year-round uh, starting uh, hopefully next year. Uh, it was year-round the year before because uh, the Pajaro Rescue Mission and Team Challenge was running it, and now it's been turned over to the uh, Salvation Army. Uh, item 25 uh, is uh, pedestrian crosswalks, and uh, that's a good thing. We're, we're seeing quite a few of those being addressed countywide making it safer for people to be able to actually cross the street without having to dodge cars. Uh, number 36, uh, uh, my only question on that one, is that money for only events for uh, pedestrian crossing, or is that also uh, infrastructure? So I don't know if anybody can answer that on item 36. Uh, maybe you can answer it after I do number 46. Uh, and uh, that is uh, on 46, whether or not there are any school um, uh, safety projects in the South County that's included. I think most of it is North County. Uh, item 54, it's a good thing to be seeing a bicycle pump jump track uh, being put in uh, at Pinot Lake County Park. 
Uh, it's very popular in the area. It's uh, right on the other side of uh, District 4, but the uh, pump track would be for kids to be able to uh, use their bikes and uh, go down there and, you know, have a good time. It'll be open to, you know, everybody. So we're looking forward to that. It's actually in District 2. But um, anyway, the money's coming from District 4, and the, uh, the dividing line is Green Valley Road from District 4 to District 2. And uh, item 57, the only question I'll have later for staff after the meeting would be, it says motels and hotels for permanent housing. And uh, that will be something that would be uh, of great interest to neighborhoods that are near uh, motels and hotels that might be converted into uh, permanent housing. Uh, maybe low-cost low housing. And uh, number 67 uh, is an item that shows that we are globally connected um, with the recycling and uh, waste uh, commission that I'm on. Uh, China is getting much more strict on the garbage that they take from the United States, and they're rejecting shiploads of garbage if it doesn't meet their, meet their new specifications. So that means that uh, we here locally will have to be more careful with all the recycling that we do, uh, whether or not uh, if we get it too much, uh, too many things contaminating the recycling, uh, it would be rejected. So we're going to have to be closer monitoring of uh, recycled material and everything in South County. Uh, and and that's, that just started last year with uh, China used to just about take anything, now they're not. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. And Supervisor Kappa, just to answer your question, I think your instincts on 36 were correct. Reading the grant information application, it is for professional services for education and outreach. It does not involve infrastructure. Okay, that's item which one? 36. 36, okay. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a long consent agenda. I have uh, comment on about five items as well. Um, uh, on item 25, <coughs> which was uh, mentioned by Supervisor Cap, this is very exciting <coughs> news. We have a number of crossworks identified in the San Lorenzo Valley that would benefit from these flashing beacons. We put one in in Ben Lomond a couple years ago. Uh, when a high state highway is really your main street in some communities, um, these become even more important than ever. And so so we appreciate um, that we will be prioritizing the crosswalk uh, projects and have identified a source of funding. That's terrific news. On item number 40, I just want to th thank um, uh, the health services and the human services about the uh, the report on the serial anemia program, the Bob Lee Community Partnership Accountability and Connection and Treatment, or PACT uh, program, and its transition to a new model. Um, and I want to thank uh, former health services director Jang Nguyen for her input in doing making this become a reality as well. Um, and number, number 50, I'd like to thank um, the Human Services Director Ellen Timberlake and her staff um, for coming up with this innovative approach to reaching more homeless folks in our county and preparing them for the workforce. Uh, this has worked out very well. In just a year's time, we have seen an enormous uh, success in the Santa Cruz Downtown Streets team. Uh, these people, um, we, we literally uh, find a way to put them to work and it uh, makes them have a better opportunity for being productive members of our society in the long run. Uh, it helps for them uh, to find full-time jobs. Uh, I think it's a great program and uh, I want to thank the Human Services team for getting us there. <coughs> Uh, item 57, which was mentioned on the housing, uh, I'm really glad to see we're getting started on these near-term re recommendations. Um, every hour that we do something meaningful is so essential uh, to create more affordable housing, and it makes it even uh, more difficult uh, the longer we wait on uh, our workforce, seniors, and recent graduates to find affordable housing units. So I'm really pleased to see that come into place. Um, 
and I think that uh, this is, you know, there's a number of, uh, of items that uh, we're going to be looking at, and this will come back to us in the fall for the real decisions. Uh, this is going to be a very, very important issue, one of the biggest ones we have in Santa Cruz County and throughout the state of California to find adequate housing, affordable housing for so many people who uh, are uh, on the brink of uh, being moved out because of high rents or high costs, uh, and so it's uh, very, very important. Um, I'd like to also mention uh, item number 70, and just mention that um, we, on, on this, um, this is a resolution appropriating some un um, unanticipated revenue uh, for some road projects, and I, I think it's very important for us to point out that $476,000 of this is from Senate Bill 1, which is going to be a huge issue come in the November election. There is going to be uh, a move to uh, have a referendum to uh, kill that that effort that provides uh, five billion dollars in transportation related funding. Uh, it's a huge boost for us. It's the first time that uh, sales tax on gas has been imp uh, increased in over 20 years in the state of California. Uh, if you you can see that there's a lot of projects going on in and around our county and throughout the state for that matter. And it's because not only did the vo local voters approve Measure D for a sales tax uh, for transportation related purposes, but uh, this Senate Bill 1 was a long time coming. Uh, we have it, it's going to, we're putting together a lot of projects. The Public Works Department is running 100 miles an hour to get as many things done as they can before the winter storms hit. Uh, but I think it's important to note or just point out when we have this big of a of a, uh, of a figure of four hundred seventy-six thousand uh, dollars, that wouldn't be there without Senate Bill One. So, uh, I think uh, we uh, we ought to remember these things when come uh, this November election. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, good morning. I just have a couple items to comment on. Uh, first is thank my colleagues and the staff for item number 25, which is uh, installing streetlights for safety. Uh, I think it's a, that's a great initiative. I'd like to request that uh, we continue items 40 and 41 to our next meeting. These are the hopes and PAC report. I just have a meeting uh, with our new director of HSA, Mimi Hall, this afternoon to answer some questions, and then uh, I'd like to get those questions answered before we take action. On item number 47, uh, although there's no funding identified, uh, expanding the behavior health unit is clearly a need in our community and I'm, um, I'm glad that staff has identified it and now we need to find the funding uh, to move that initiative forward. On item number 50, which is the CalFresh funding, as Supervisor McPherson mentioned, uh, for the streets team, uh, this is really a wonderful initiative and the fact that we're able to get people job training and, um, and uh, the dignity of work work as, as well as uh, support. I think it's a wonderful thing and it should be mentioned uh, because it has a real big impact on the city's budget in the, in the response to the mayor's request about county initiatives. This is a, uh, we should make sure to mention this, uh, this action today um, in, in, that, in that response back. And finally on item number 66, which is the wharf to wharf, I'm just uh, happy that, uh, that as you run the wharf to wharf this year, you'll be able to check out the new Twin Lakes uh, improvements as you go by, uh, and so make sure everyone enjoys them. And uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a great day. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. So, uh, you would like to add that as additional direction onto item 18, then regarding the letter. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, this uh, consent agenda is a, is a small encyclopedia of the work that we do as county government. Um, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to d just call out several of the items, but I encourage the public to take a look at this uh, agenda because there are so many things that shows the, the many ways in which the county interacts with so many different parts of our lives. Um, on item number 17, uh, uh, the item about the tax exchange uh, for the LAFCO application. Um, this is a, uh, I'm really glad to see this moving forward. I appreciate the support of the board uh, in doing this. This is uh, gonna help us um, 
uh, improve fire service for people uh, as well as uh, deal with some other issues. But I also appreciate the leadership from both uh, Central Fire and County Fire in working together to figure out how to make this work well. Uh, so I appreciate that work. On item number 20, I just want to call out the, the this is the living wage program status report. It's an annual status report uh, about the difference we're making in the lives of uh, over uh, 100 people. Uh, 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 in making sure that they have a living wage and making sure that we index that to the real cost of living. Um, it's a way of using the purchasing power of the county to, to influence the, the lives and impact the lives of people in our community, and I'm glad to see that moving forward. Um, it has been uh, commented uh, about uh, item number 25 about this is for CSA 9A, uh, but it's uh, trying to target a funding source that we already have, no new uh, uh, taxes to be able to use in a way to create uh, uh, safety lighting uh, at crosswalks. I think it's uh, well worthwhile and I appreciate the support uh, from the board in this. Uh, on item number 43, uh, which is the five-year agreement with Dientes Community Dental Care, uh, you know, we've, we've heard these uh, reports about the, the state of oral health in our community. Uh, Dientes is the leader in really help, try, trying to help us close the gaps in coverage that we have. Um, I appreciate all the work that they do. I think it's a great partnership that the county has with them. And I look forward to an expansion of services into Live Oak uh, in the near future. Thank you for the work. Um, on item number 47, I'm glad to see this report back. Uh, from health services uh, about the old Harbor Veterinary Hospital building. I, I, I want to add uh, some urgency. You know, one thing we know is that young people um, are showing up more and more in our mental health system, being able to turn this facility into something that young people can use uh, and receive services will help families in Santa Cruz County. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it some more during the budget sessions, but this seems like a critical piece uh, for our, the day and age that we are here in Santa Cruz. And I want to see this continue to move forward. Um, on item number 56, which is our uh, uh, report on our housing services contract, I'm really glad to see this moving forward. And I just also want to acknowledge Senior Network Services for the ongoing work that they do. I'm glad to see it's funded as part of this uh, to be able to link seniors with who have housing with others who are in need is a win-win situation. And thank you, Senior Network Services, for your ongoing work in that area. On item number 57, I'd like to pull the item because I have some questions and some additional uh, directions, uh, but it's kind of too much to take on here uh, uh, as part of the consent agenda. Okay, item 57 will become item 75.1. We'll take it right after consent. Right. Uh, on item number 68, uh, I uh, hope we're successful with these grant applications. Uh, recently, we talked about uh, traffic through Soquel and the need uh, for a new light, uh, this synchronization uh, process uh, project will be very helpful in, in alleviating the, the traffic uh, issues that are in uh, the village and uh, close to it, and I think this will be really helpful, and I appreciate the support uh, from our members who serve on the Air Resources District Board. On item number 70, uh, I'll just, uh, I'm really glad to see us moving forward on the different ways in which we are funding road repair programs. My constituents on Granite Creek and North Branch of 40 will be very happy. They were very excited when they read in the newspaper that their roads were going to be fixed. Uh, and so this moving forward is, uh, is, is, a gr is really important. And as my colleague mentioned, SB1 is a critical uh, funding source for uh, transportation. Uh, in Santa Cruz County in the state of California, um, it asked those who use the roads to actually pay for the upkeep of the roads. Uh, last, uh, the last item that I'll comment on is uh, item number 74, which is the uh, cooperation agreement between the county and Santa Cruz about the redevelopment. There are some funding. Uh, one of them is for the Heart of Soquel project, which I'm really glad to see moving forward, and the last bit of funding for the Twin Lakes project. These are two really worthwhile projects, and I'm glad to see that, that the, the few dollars that are left in that, those accounts are being used for those worthwhile projects. Lastly, I just want to congratulate my colleagues, uh, Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Caput, for their first place finish. Although the votes are not counted, or finished counting, um, 
it was, it was a nice vote of confidence in the board to see the, the, uh, the existing uh, members of this board uh, be in first place. So congratulations. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. I'll make a couple brief comments, provide some additional direction on item 18. Uh, since there is a $210,000 commitment come budget time from contingencies, I'd like to provide additional direction that makes any ongoing uh, financial commitment from the county contingent upon a renegotiation of the underlying funding formula. Uh, and if that's unable to be met, to come back with us in mid-year budget time to explain how it would be that we'd be able to fund this ongoing. We also have additional direction from Supervisor Coonerty on that item. I'd like to echo my colleagues' comments on item 43 and the great work that Dantas does. Uh, I'm glad that we're able to do this five-year agreement with Dantas. Uh, they're making a significant impact on people's lives within the community. It's a, a health crisis that really isn't covered in the same way as other health crises, and uh, you're doing it, uh, Ms. Marcus, and the work that you do to truly make a difference in people's lives. I appreciate the work that you're doing, especially in the South County. On item 54, uh, as my colleague Supervisor Caput said this will provide a great recreational opportunity for those in the South County at Pinto Lake, the work that we can do uh, to provide this, this pump track. Uh, when we had the initial community meeting out there, there were well over 100 people attended and a lot of young families were excited about the opportunity. Uh, Item 62, which is uh, the request for qualifications for uh, a design build component for the Aptos Branch Library. I'd like to thank uh, those that are here from the Aptos Branch Library and those who are here from the library system in support of it. Uh, when we passed Measure S a couple years ago, we made a lot of commitments to the community about what would be possible and what could be done. And uh, we've actually seen a significant amount of progress with Felton and some of the other work that's starting uh, throughout the county in La Selva Beach and soon in Aptos. And I'm excited to support this and move it forward and see what we can get done uh, for the Mid and South County. And on item 68, as Supervisor Leopold mentioned, uh, there are a couple of important applications through the AB 2766 Emission Reduction Grant Program. Uh, we also on our last agenda had something regarding uh, electric vehicles as well. Supervisor Coonerty and I serve on the Air District, and this is a significant funding source for us to do programs and policies and even infrastructure that helps reduce air pollution within our county. So that is our comments on consent. We'd like to open it up for the community. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items on consent. Note that item 57, which was the housing item, has been pulled to the regular agenda, but it'll be heard immediately after consent and oral communications is item 75.1. Is there anybody from the community that'd like to address us on items on the consent agenda? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. My name is John McCoy. I live in Aptos and uh, my comment was going to be on 57, but it also applies to 84, and that is the creation of... Well, I, I don't mean to, to get you on procedural here, but uh, item 84 is on the regular agenda, and so we'll hear that later on. Uh, so item 57, if you can just hold those comments for just another few minutes, I promise I'll give you an opportunity because okay. it's been pulled into the regular agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on the consent agenda? Now would be your opportunity. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I would like to pull item number 59 um, regarding Aptos Village Project and put it on the regular agenda. Okay, item 59 will become 75.2. Thank you. I also uh, want to um, applaud the, the efforts to expand and improve the Aptos Library. It's a wonderful facility and serves a very large section of the Mid and South County population. So thank you for um, moving that along. Staff and the public are very excited. Um, I would like to comment on item number 25, the board allocating yearly $900,000 for lighted pedestrian crossings. I applaud that effort. I did not see a list of proposed crossings to uh, to put forth for the first round of, of um, measures, but I would like to ask that the board hold public uh, meetings in uh, to help get public input on which crossings will receive this aid. And again, thank you. There have been a, too many deaths of people being hit um, in crosswalks and in, on our public roadways. Um, I just want to comment that I see in item 28, uh, your board is very happy with Mr. Palacio's performance and you're moving him up to the next pay raise uh, level. I. Um, 
I didn't write down which number it is, but it has to do with parks and the uh, Sycamore concession and the soup shack at Rio Del Mar concessions uh, at the um, Rio Del Mar Beach. I'm just a little concerned that this is the very thing that the former property owner, Mr. Um, McGinnis wanted to do, and the county made it so difficult and expensive for him that he he basically threw up his hands. So I want to point out the incongruity in this action, that it's okay if the county wants to do it, but when a business owner wants to do it with their own property, it is near to impossible and prohibitively expensive. I also um, want to comment on item 57, the, uh, accept the planning department's work to... 57 has uh, been pulled. Oh, okay. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. And um, 69, approving CRISP to do striping in North County. I just want to make sure that that was put out to bid. This is the same contractor that will be doing the work in the South County, uh, partially giving a gift of public money to the Aptos Village project developers by doing striping work within the area that they should be repairing themselves. Um, and uh, number 78, is that on the consent? Um, That's on the regular agenda. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much, that's all, and I will look forward to the pulled item. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else who would like to address us specifically on the consent agenda? Good morning. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Item 21, the communications tower at uh, Davenport uh, with county money of what, 317,000. It's well documented the harm of these communication towers emitting microwave radiation. And again, draw your attention to an expert from the uh, British Royal Navy who worked in the 60s and 70s, Barry Trower. You can see him on YouTube. And he said, to his knowledge, the first reports of microwave sickness, which these radiation emitting towers uh, produce lots of, it was reported in 1932 with uh, symptoms of fatigue, uh, fitful sleep, intolerability, uh, weakened immune systems. And you have been provided his declaration, and he says, um, the paradox, of course, is how microwave radiation weaponry can be used to cause impairment, illness, and death, and at the same time be used as a communications tool. It can't be used safely. When we talk about having safety, things for safety and health, and microwave radiation is an outcome of it, it's totally contradictory, it's hypocritical. Here's another quote from him. In 1975, and I have copies of a uh, declaration if anybody asks me, after an intensive study ex uh, by the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, they warned all of its personnel of the risk from low-level microwaves, including illnesses ranging from microwave sickness, flu-like symptoms, depression, suicidal tendencies, to cancer and leukemia, biological effects of electromagnetic radiation. This is from the Defense Intelligence Agency, 1975. Uh, regarding a brief comment here about the CAO number 28 receiving more money, instead I'd like to see all the employees of this county uh, who are the glue that hold all the workings together, I'd like to see them all have a pay raise instead. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us specifically on the consent agenda? Good morning, Ms. Marcus. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for your comments earlier. And um, I am Laura Marcus from Deanthus Community Dental Care, and I want to thank you for the county's continued support. Each one of you have contributed over the years to our strategy and our long-term plans uh, and success, and I thank you for that. And we do very much look forward to partnering in Live Oak, Supervisor Leopold's district, to um, increase access to care in, in the very near future. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on consent? Seeing none, oh, yes. Is there anybody else I'd like to address us on consent after this, after this gentleman speaks? Okay. Well, Hi. can you please uh, step forward? Feel free to line up. Hi, good morning. Good morning, welcome. Um, I would just like to make a comment on item number 70. Um, I'd like to add to the importance of SB1 funding that will come up for a vote for its continuation in November. And to add to Supervisor McPherson's comments on the importance of it, um, the increase that's been going on not only here but, but in California, throughout California, is due to the um, transfer of the funding. Um, and, and it's a lot. It, I know it's a big increase, but it, unfortunately, if it had been increased over the years, we'd probably be at the same point. So um, I hope everybody keeps that into consideration. Um, also, remember that Prop 69 that we voted on currently this last ju um, in June, um, beginning of June, um, protects transportation funding in the future, so it can't be siphoned off elsewhere. So um, that's a good protection. And Santa Cruz County is a self-help county with its passage of the previous sales tax, so there's some funding, extra funding for self-help counties that maybe some people might not be aware of that uh, we will be getting. So um, it's really important to get everybody to support the continuation of SB1. In Thank November. you. And sir, what's your name for the record? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Steve Rosati, uh, Aptos. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name is Leila Mavris, and I'm the new executive director for the Conflict Resolution Center of Santa Cruz County. And I'm here just to um, express my gratitude and thank you for putting the number 32 on the agenda and approving the additional funding that the Conflict Resolution Center needed in order to continue our work in partnership with probation in offering victim offender dialogue services. And this is such an important work and we're, we're directly diverting our youth from going into the, um, our justice system and uh, giving them a, a second chance and also realizing uh, um, the, the, the issues that, uh, that are at hand given their actions. So thank you very much and I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else for consent? All right, seeing so no one bring it back to the board for action. I would move the consent agenda as amended. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. That's continuing item 40 and 41 to the next agenda, and that's pulling uh, item 57 and I believe it was 59 uh, to the regular agenda. All and the, the additional and the direction, additional direction on, on, on number 18. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We now move on to oral communications, which is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors and our planning staff gets to enjoy it as well. <laughs> Good morning and welcome Ms. McNulty. Good morning, Gail McNulty, Santa Cruz County Greenway. Um, Supervisors, first of all, thank you for all of your conscientious dedication to our county and all of the important work you do. We're grateful to the board for its past and current efforts to uphold and strengthen our county's proud history of environmental protection. With this in mind, I hope all of you have had a chance to read The Case Against Progressive Rail, George Dondero's rebuttal, and Greenway's response to that rebuttal. Director Dondero's memo validates the concerns we raise and fails to debunk them. The information provided by Greenway is factual, documented, and deserves your utmost concern. It's an example of the due diligence agencies must perform to keep our county safe in a transaction of this magnitude. The RTC needs a plan to help Watsonville freight customers move shipments 2.5 miles between Watsonville and Pajaro. For that simple problem, we are now considering the most complex possible solution. The Progressive Rail contract, up for approval this Thursday, proposes an aggressive model that would leave our county vulnerable to troubling loopholes that allow the federal freight rail industry to exploit unsuspecting communities. It also directly conflicts with Measure D's promise to get Santa Cruz County moving and compromises the fairness of the Unified Corridor Study set to conclude at the end of this year. 
The entire county needs safe routes to school, better transit options, and serious efforts to alleviate gridlock, not dangerous, polluting, traffic stalling freight trains. Spending six months negotiating with Progressive Rail rather than looking for a simple solution to a simple problem has been a mistake. Bureaucracy can make it difficult to pivot. However, pivoting sooner rather than later, before a ton of taxpayer money is wasted and neighborhoods and nature are permanently damaged, is the right thing to do. Please don't open a can of worms that even $300,000 may not be able to close. The time has come to say no to progressive rail. Please vote no on Thursday, those of you that sit on the RTC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McDulty. Good morning, welcome back. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Supervisor. Um, the First Amendment is a linchpin of freedom. Uh, this is an update on the supervisor shutting down regular scheduled presentation by the decade-old uh, Freedoms Forum. Uh, the censorship was on display in Live Oak and in Aptos last September. Threatening calls came from Zach Friend, John Leopold, to the provider of a facility, including warnings that there might be violent demonstrations. Those threats of intimidation uh, to the management of the facility providing that space was effective. The topic was to be about 9-11, a subject of interest in the community. The same speaker was heard a year earlier at Supervisor Coonerty's uh, Resource Center. Uh, Freedom Forum then arranged for the talk to be held at a Grange in Aptos. The manager of the facility was threatened by Leopold and Zach Friend. He said they made specific threats against members of the board and the facility itself. Words to the effect, and I quote from the witness, I wouldn't want anything to happen to your board members and certainly wouldn't want anything to happen to your facility. Nice going. Um, COPA is an organization formed by Saul Alinsky, who wrote his book, uh, Book of Rat for Radicals, uh, dedicated to Lucifer. It was created by millionaire Marshall Field. It's run by Tim McManus of the Industrial Areas Foundation. Both Friend and Leopold belong to one of those associations that are members of COPA. They claim in their own literature they can get from 500 to 5,000 people activated at, at, at will. Their own literature says the Panetta Institute has been an investor for, of COPA over the decade. We know the Panetta machine has endorsed the supermajority of the supervisors of this board. We know that Panetta sent military information to espionage agent Hugh DeLacy. The California State Senate, run by Democratic Hugh DeLacy, claimed him a communist enforcer. The attack on free speech to be, appears to be a project of the Panetta machines that runs the county and COPA and the pro-globalist -glo uh, pressure group. Communist DeLacy uh, circulated the petition for former supervisor Robbie Levy. They all have a copy of it in front of them right now. Uh, Zach Friend is an heir to Levy's uh, 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 position in Aptos. Uh, Hugh DeLacy is involved with a number of Soviet spies, some being uh, traveled to communist China. Bruce McPherson was endorsed by a communist Chinese triple agent, and it's on the front page of a U.S. News and World Report. I encourage the supervisors to object to these type of threats and the destruction of freedom of speech and take, take down the monuments dedicated to Hugh DeLacy and make a resolution against your supervisors ever threatening free speech in this county again. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Good morning. This is for items not on the agenda. Good morning. Yes, uh, my name is John McCoy again from Aptos. On a lighter note, I just wanted to uh, express my support for low-income housing, and I want to say that the most appropriate course of action is to start by preserving what you have even before um, programs are initiated to, to spend money and resources on new uh, um, low-income housing. And specifically, without reading my notes or anything, I would like to talk about additional dwelling units. There's been uh, programs created for them in the county here. Um, property tax is administered by the state 
Board of Equalization and administered with some discretion locally. There is a loophole in the um, regulations that treat additional dwelling units the same as a duplex or a, a commercial apartment building. And when a senior under Prop 60 tries to transfer their Prop 13 protection to a retirement home one time in their life, and also for a Prop 90 disabled person, if there's an additional dwelling unit on the property, you lose that portion of your valuation effectively killing the transfer. And the only way around that is to tear out the additional dwelling unit, evict the client for no cause, make your transaction, and then it's up to the new property owner if they wanna reinstall it or not. I think state law is going to change on that. And I would encourage the County Board of Supervisors to be forward thinking enough to prepare for eventual change in this cruel portion of our regulations and laws. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Good morning, welcome, thanks for waiting. Morning, my name is Ed Cummins, I live in Aptos. I wanna talk about ADUs also. I went to your office meeting the other day, but your assistant was there, he was very helpful. These seven pages, cost me 13,000 bucks, and that's not even the beginning. The Soquel Creek Water District is the enemy that is common to everybody who wants to build an ADU in this county and in their district. They want 30,000 bucks to put a water meter in for 640 square feet. I appreciate the changes that you guys have recently made as far as conversions. Unfortunately, this is not a conversion. You guys need to lean on them and have them fall more in line with other water districts. The city of Santa Cruz charges 7,000 bucks. Pajaro, it's 4,000 bucks. Scotts Valley, for some reason, it's 21,000. I haven't got a whole answer out of them on why it's 21,000. But I gotta put 14 toilets in other people's houses. And I gotta use their approved contractor to put the water meter in. And that's 12 to 14,000 bucks. All of this adds up and takes away at this 640 square feet. That's it. It's a tiny corner of this building. We moved back here a couple, last year to help my parents age in place. They're older. We moved away because of the high housing costs. I bought a brand new house in Sioux Falls, South Dakota on a quarter acre of land for 149,000 bucks. This 640 square feet the minimum bid I've got to do this, the minimum is 160,000. I've recently read, you know, the piece in the Aptos Times, the Sentinel thing this last Saturday, this last Sunday. I don't know where these figures for 127,000 bucks are coming from to build something. It's not the reality. It's, it's just not. Senator Wachowski is passing and is trying to get through like the final round of changes. Senate, Senate Bill 831, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but if it happens, it's gonna strip this building permit down to just a basic building permit. It's gonna take all the special district fees away. I've talked to the SoCal Creek Water District about it and they're shaking in their boots. But you guys wonder why these aren't being built. And it's because of water districts. I don't mind paying a thousand bucks for the fire department. I don't mind helping the schools out. I don't mind helping other people out. But that water district, I'm asking you guys to lean on them and have them ease up on the ADUs. And they want to hear this much of it. All they want to hear is, where's our toilets? That's it. So please help people out. This is a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Just to follow a bit on what the gentleman before me said, it, if you're Barry Swenson Builder, it's okay. You don't have to pay that, and they cannot verify that all the toilets and urinals that Swenson said they put in at Cabrillo actually happened. Uh, so Cal Creek Water District can't verify it, and neither can Cabrillo College. And the former maintenance uh, facilities director said he doesn't think it all happened. He had to call them back over and over again. So it just depends on who you are, doesn't it? 
I want to comment on um, this Friday. The zoning administrator will hear an application for the Sand Rock Hill B&B &B to get a special use permit to have 150 guests 10 times a year with amplified music, and that will be expanded to 24 times a year. This is an historic B&B &B on Freedom Boulevard in a residential area. And I have heard the people who live near them complain that there have already been so many problems with amplified music, parking, and I just want to uh, really question the uh, wisdom of the county to even consider this kind of an agreement in the rural residential area. That's this Friday at the Zoning Administrative Hearing. I also want to thank you for putting in the back of the room um, the notebook of, of today's um, agenda and communication but it is missing documents. It is missing communication that I know were sent in on different items. And um, I would like to ask that uh, the information be complete in the back. But thank you very much. It helps tremendously to have it there so people don't have to run down the hall while you're in session. I also want to uh, make a comment about fire safety in our area. I am uh, concerned about the tall grass that I see all along our public roadways including um, Highway 1, at a time when the fuels are very dry and fire danger is very high. So I would like to ask that you work with Public Works and get the mowers going out there to make our county more fire safe. I would also like to ask that you uh, work, uh, especially Supervisor Friend, with Public Works to clear the debris and, and vegetation going out into the bike lane on Freedom Boulevard. It's a very dangerous place, actually, for bicyclists to go because of the eroded material that sometimes almost completely covers the bike lane, uh, berries and poison oak that extend out into the bike lane, forcing cyclists out into the dangerous, very fast roadway. So I'd really like to see, for the safety of our county cyclists, that area, that corridor in particular, get some attention. And finally, I would like to voice my extreme disappointment with the action the board took regarding the Nissan dealership. You wiped away housing for a car dealership. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else like to address this during oral communications? Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. I come here also because I consider it my public citizen responsibility to attempt to give you direction in, on the path to real health and safety, and to share information of the documented harm. I've been focusing on microwave radiation weaponry technology. So in that line, here's another article, uh, this time from Newsweek in the trade and science section. And this is from, um, May of this year. Radiation from cell phones, Wi-Fi, are hurting the birds and the bees. 5G may make it worse. Technology is quite literally destroying nature with a new report further confirming that electromagnetic radiation from power lines and cell towers can disorient birds and insects and destroy plant health. The paper warns that as nations switch to 5G, this threat could increase. In the new analysis, Eclipse, a EU-funded review body dedicated to policy that may impact biodiversity, and the ecosystem looked at over 87 studies on how electromagnetic radiation may affect the environment. You've also been provided with other documents uh, on this very topic, one titled, Bees, Birds, and Mankind Destroying Nature by Electro smog uh, that came out about 10 years ago, translated from the German. This article concludes 
We apply limits to all types of pollution to protect the habitability of our environment, but as yet, even in Europe, the safe limits of electromagnetic radiation have not been determined, let alone applied, said Matt Charlot, CEO of a charity group called Bug Life, The Telegraph reported. So I'm gonna leave you with this and say, that your top responsibility is to protect the quality of life and the health and safety of those you represent, including wildlife in this area. To not do that is not only irresponsible, I, I think it's, it borders on criminal, especially when you know the harm of the wireless microwave radiation. It needs to stop. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Thank Here's you. The Anybody else like to address this in oral communications? This is your last opportunity, please, before we begin the regular agenda. Is there anybody else past this gentleman? All right, thank you. Morning. Uh, good to be back. Um, my name is Richard Lewis. I'm a gray panther, a step above the gray bears. And I'm here because a very important event happened in your town of Watsonville. I ask if I can just stop and say youth voice and student empowerment is an international human right. I'd like you to begin to speak in your network around that particular quote. But what I brought with me today is basically an organization that brought parents all the way from Jalisco where this organization gets them a visa. And, and the videos of showing what took place in Watsonville is awesome. So my invitation is go to Facebook. The name of the organization is Jalisco International Federation. This is two years ago. But all I can say is those people here in Santa Cruz that are sourcing, bringing this organization will someday before you interact as you know, the last time I was here, 35, 32, and you on the board, particularly you, John, were looking at how do you more involve that community of Latinos. So I'm here just to give you an invitation uh, as we move forward. The beautiful thing, not only bringing grandmas and grandpas who never saw their kids to our county, is they have a partnership, and that partnership is bringing students from Jalisco to UCLA. What if we bring students from Jalisco over here to UC Santa Cruz? So I'm a loose cannon. It's been said, it's like building the boat while build, sailing the boat while building it. But I know, of, I know of what could come to be if you do research. There could be a next generation commission in our county and cities, that there could be a youth mayor revisit to Watsonville's city council. So I leave you with that quote, take on, listen to the future. Use this plan, which we'll have an opportunity to learn as you vote on it, as a process <clears throat> to make a better Santa Cruz County is to do something different. So, Thank you for allowing me to blah, blah, blah. But if I've done right, then we are gonna do something that never has been done and other counties will come to Santa Cruz and, and see what all of us can do. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address us in oral communications? Okay, we'll close oral communications. We'll begin the regular agenda. The first item on the regular agenda is pulled item 57. <laughs> Uh, which is the direct staff to work on near-term amendments to the county code that would support creation of affordable housing as recommended by the planning director and the Housing Advisory Commission. Supervisor Leopold, you pulled the item. I don't know if you wanted to begin with the report or if you wanted to open up with comments. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, I don't necessarily need a report. Uh, there was a couple of comments and questions I had. You know, I think that, that um, this board has been very committed to looking at issues about how to increase affordability. And so I appreciate the discussion that took place at the Housing Advisory Commission. And um, what's in uh, this item, I, I think generally um, uh, there's a lot, of, I can see a lot to support. Um, but I have some questions. 
about a couple things. One is it's very unclear to me what the environmental review process is. When we've looked at questions about mixed use uh, and changing our, our, our percentages for mixed use, um, and even the farm worker housing piece, we've said that that needs to go to EIR, an EIR that hasn't happened yet that we've been waiting for as part of the sustainable Santa Cruz County and code modernization. So it, I'm trying to figure out why, what, 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 how this relates uh, to that because it seems we, we shouldn't have to sacrifice env environmental protection for, um, uh, for affordable housing. Good question. Uh, Kathy Malloy, Planning Director. Um, it's a very good point, and in the past we have conveyed to you a very conservative approach to doing any further code modifications because we did have litigation going on uh, for a few years, and we finally did get an opinion, uh, a court ruling in the Court of Appeals that as long as we could define independent utility or there's a, another specific project objective that's different than sort of the overall updating of the zoning districts, which is the primary thing about code mod, that, um, that it's not CEQA segmentation. And so we, for, to take your example of the mixed use code amendments, the near-term changes regarding mixed use wouldn't be for all mixed use projects. It would only um, address affordable housing projects. Like right now, if you're 100% affordable, you can be up to two-thirds of your square footage to residential purposes. That's what we want to examine and see whether maybe a further adjustment of that for affordable housing projects might make some of them more feasible. So the, the farm worker housing, again, that's in a section of our code that doesn't rely on you know, <coughs> updating the whole zoning districts or process. It's specialized to reflecting the state laws, current state law about affordable uh, farm worker housing, as well as some local provisions that we think fit Santa Cruz County. And again, it's specific to affordable housing. So that's how we're differentiating this set of near-term proposed uh, work efforts from the larger code mod and sustainability update. Okay, there's a lot. There's a lot there. It would yeah. be uh, it would be helpful to if you could share the uh, the the court ruling or at least the citation so we could take a look at that. Um, I think that would be useful um, uh, to understand, uh, you know, what risk or not risk that we're taking um, on the farm worker housing. Do we expect that uh, w these amendments will restrict it to farm workers, or do you think that it will? It, it, that it's going to be broad. It'll be agricultural employee uh, workers as required by state law, and we do have mechanisms in the proposal, which we'll you know continue to refine, that would ensure that. Um, on the density bonus piece, again, this may be something that's really good, but um, doesn't this tr trigger general plan co consequences? Of, uh, you know, and w what would that be, and what would be the process for those? It may, and that'll be one of the things we take a look at this summer as we carry out this work. Under state law, the 35% density bonus per state law does not trigger uh, density concerns or general plan consistency issues. Adding another 15% going up to 50%, that's what we'll be looking at to see whether we might also need a general plan policy or something else that, to ensure that we have consistency. Um, the other uh, concern I have, and I'll be looking at this as, as uh, and I want to make a suggestions of things that could, could come back to us when, it, when you bring this back, is uh, we completed a sustainable Santa Cruz County plan where we looked at uh, increases in density on our trans transit corridors, recognizing that uh, increased density was needed given the, the limits that the voters have been placed, placed on us by Measure J. Uh, but also recognizing that transit-oriented development is actually a smart environmental um, success if it's, if it's done appropriately. So it, it seems to me that um, uh, when I look at the density bonus effort and I look at the, the R combining district, I don't want us to, to, to stray from the, those kind of planning concepts that we've had extensive discussions uh, with the community about. So it seems the, the appropriate that we have some kind of overlay district so people could see where these 
um, uh, m might be uh, enacted <clears throat> because there may be, uh, I would argue that there are places where it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to put a, 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 a dense housing project. I don't think everywhere is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if we want to honor the process uh, that, we, that we engage the public on, and which we're trying to finish through the environmental review, is that we should develop policies that support that planning concept and not just start throwing new things on there because the concern um, that I think uh, people have is they want good uh, uh, development in the right places. Mm -hmm. They just don't want any development in any place. And uh, so I think we need to have an overlay about where that would be possible and, and not make the assumption that anywhere um, uh, that you may be able to, to have an R combining uh, site or e even uh, an enhanced density bonus program depending on, on what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I just think there hasn't been any analysis of that and uh, that those are my concerns. Mm -hmm. The other uh, piece, uh, and when it, after we hear uh, testimony, uh, I'd like to add uh, some additional direction because I think as we look at, at these new tools um, uh, to sort of build out what we envisioned as part of the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, um, we're trying to build something that's sustainable, walkable, transit-oriented, uh, more dense development. And uh, one of the things that I, I've, I've regularly uh, talked about is that to, to ensure that the infrastructure is in place to be able to support these new kinds of development. Um, and whether that be wider sidewalks or uh, good bike lanes or, um, or even parks, we need to be able to support um, uh, this kind of new development. And so I, I'd like to add a direction that, uh, that uh, we ask public works and maybe economic development to come up with some strategies about how we can take a portion. We have a limited amount of funds. Uh, and right now we, we, um, uh, we distribute them on the number of road miles that we have. Um, that may not be the best way to continue to do it, and I think we should carve out some portion of our, of our public works or parks funds and say that we're going to hold them aside in the places where we put the most housing or most jobs, that we should, there should be more infrastructure investment to be able to support this kind of activity. Uh, because uh, otherwise we will have uh, great housing, um, but they won't be able to walk somewhere, they won't be able to bike somewhere, they won't be able to, to recreate somewhere. And we've created a problem when we could actually spend our money wisely to, to, to put resources where uh, we put the developments. So I'll have some additional uh, direction about that. Uh, those are the concerns uh, that I had, and I don't know whether you want to hear testimony, then I'll be ready to make a motion. Yeah, I think that there's people that are interested in this item. I'd like to open it up for members of the community to uh, speak to us on this item, then we can bring it back to the board for a discussion about whether that'll be accepted in, to a motion. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Kate Roberts, resident of Santa Cruz, and I'm the president of MBEP. I just wanted to first off thank you all for your service and the um, complicated issue that housing is and really un thoughtfully engaging and understanding. I do hear some of your concerns, Supervisor Leopold, and I think that getting to this point has been quite a journey. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a prop to the work that MBEP has done in this area. Two and a half years ago, we started on our housing initiative. We um, published in January a policy recommendation paper of nine low-hanging fruit types of policies that local jurisdictions could implement without having to go back and revisit general plans and zoning laws. And I'm really super excited to see that this work has been a small part of getting us to this point at the county. We've done work in all the other um, 17 jurisdictions throughout the region. And as a resident of this county, I'm most proud that we are really taking action and not continuing to kick the can down the road on the housing initiative. We all realize how important, how vital affordable housing is to this area. And um, again, I'm just really grateful that you guys are moving ahead and uh, thank you again for your, your service and your action on this very important topic. Thanks. Ms. Roberts, I, I just had a question. I'm, I'm sure I'll be asking others this question. 
is uh, I know you, you've, uh, MBEP has held regular conferences and I know some of these issues have been discussed, so I appreciate that because it's helping educate. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I'm still interested in ensuring that we have a community discussion about some of these things because I think it's a, it's not a well under, these are not a well understood set of tools. And I want to encourage MBEP and the other community uh, members here to actually start holding those community discussions to help people better understand how these schools could be useful to providing affordable housing. I think it will be a lot easier for us to adopt them when they come um, if we've had that community conversation and I want to encourage you and others to, to, to have that. May I respond? Please. We, um, with the launch of the Affordable Housing Week, uh, October of last year here in Santa Cruz County, we held our first what we called Affordable Housing 101 community event and that was such a hit that we have actually done I think now eight or nine with staff's help and Sibley Simon who is uh, the lead author on that paper to do exactly that, Supervisor Leopold, to bring the community together to understand the complexity of these issues and do that throughout the whole region. So I completely agree with you. We need to have people understand how complex these issues are and the work that needs to be done. And that's why I don't underestimate the fine work that this board has been doing on that topic. So, and staff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Good morning, Mr. Simon. Welcome. Thank you, Sibley Simon. Um, I'm excited that we're here considering this. Uh, I think these are excellent recommendations. I appreciate your comments and questions. Uh, Supervisor Leopold, I think they're very appropriate. If there's anything I can do um, to assist in any way addressing those um, questions and concerns, I'd love to do that. Um, I'm uh, excited that you know this tool on the density bonus in particular is being looked at and considered and to your points to staff's points you know has to be looked at very carefully but um, you know it's been used very successfully in some other places to get affordable housing without the public having to pay directly for the construction of it and then that's really exciting to me because we have limited dollars to build so it's, it convinces more you know, market rate developers to build more affordable housing uh, in their projects. I think that's great. What um, I want to offer um, one more topic that we're going to be talking a little bit about the city of Santa Cruz today um, and that we have uh, recommended in this process but is not currently in the recommendations is we have to figure out and I think in our region how to bend more of the housing development work that's not paid for with public funds toward rental housing as opposed to for sale housing. So most of what gets built that doesn't have public funds is for sale and that doesn't help the overall affordability uh, of the market nearly as much as building rental housing. So, you know, there's more folks out of the area who will buy the for sale housing, you know, et cetera. And to some of the comments you guys have all made today, you know, we have a lot of people struggling uh, to pay rent in particular. So one of the things that has been done, again, on this in other places in California is using this bonus density tool where a larger bonus density is, uh, uh, projects can be eligible for a larger bonus density um, if the project is small rental units and small can be in square footage it can be a number of bedrooms and and uh, and then not condo map so you're assured that it's going to continually be rented as opposed to sold and in those cases um, you know that's harder to pencil out so developers just don't do it um, but if we can tip the scale toward that it's extremely helpful because then not only we get uh, and often that larger bonus density doesn't create a larger building or more bedrooms because you're sure they're small units, so you get just more units, density in that sense, not density in some of the other senses that we're concerned about. Um, and uh, that way uh, you can tip more of our production to rental housing and have a, a bigger effect. Um, so it's something I'm very interested in and love to uh, engage in um, in this process or subsequently. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Dr. Ann Lopez. I'm the director of Center for Farmworker Families. I'm here to speak on behalf of farm workers. Thank you. 
<laughs> um, I have worked with farm workers in Watsonville now for 20 years, two decades, and um, I have all I can tell you is that the housing situation is absolutely disgraceful. I think it's really a blight in our county, and I hope that you got the letter that um, Affordable Housing Now group asked me to send out, but um, I gave you a couple of examples of 16 people living in less than 1,000 square feet, um, and uh, people, farm workers actually die in this county, and it's never, to my knowledge, recorded. Uh, about five years ago, we had two farm worker men who rented a garage for $1,000 a month, and they got cold in the winter and lit a barbecue and died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that goes on that I hear about all the time, but I don't see that it's a public issue. And since we have 13,000 to 20,000, a small city worth of farm workers, most of whom are undocumented uh, in this county, I think since they provide our food supply and support a nearly $2 billion industry of strawberries in the state, we really need to do something to ameliorate the, the pain that they're in and the, po the extreme poverty. Uh, no one can afford rents when they're making thirteen dollars to $17,000 a year. So I ask you to make this a priority, and I know that most of them are undocumented, but consider the fact that our trade policies ran them off of their farms in Mexico, and that's why they're here. So I think as a county, we could take some responsibility and allow them to live in a place where they they can rest after 10 hours, 10 hour days, and just have single family units instead of four or five families crammed into different units. So, um, I, I just wanted to point out that far, the, the, I only have 31 seconds, but there's only four choices for farm workers. They can live in the migrant camp and have their kids' education disrupted with the 50-mile regulation. They can live in crowded households. Um, they can live in the Mid-Peninsula Housing Authority, which I highly recommend as a model for agricultural worker housing. However, it takes five to seven years to get into that uh, one of those establishments on a waiting list, sorry. And finally, you can try to live by the river um, and not pay rent until, I'm going, until, <laughs> until, uh, excuse me, until you are thrown out. So something needs to be done. Thank you for Thank you, listening. Dr. Lopez. Thank you for your work. Good morning, Mr. Dela Cruz. Welcome. Thank you, Rick Dela Cruz. <clears throat> um, Aptos area and so forth. Um, we're a little late to this subject, and so really all I want to do is open up further discussion um, and start by complimenting the housing uh, management staff that's been real helpful with us for a project we're working on. Um, the emphasis I want to start the county thinking about is a greater, more dynamic, uh, strategy to develop senior housing. We develop senior housing and special needs housing. Some of you may be aware of a memory care facility that we recently opened in the city of Santa Cruz. We've been looking at other places throughout the county and uh, as you know, finding land, assembly land is a little bit of an effort. So there's three areas I'd like you to explore without losing the momentum because I know it's, it's taken a long time to get here. First is Let's take another look at uh, the requirement that if you have off-site affordable housing to a project that it's restricted to that particular um, uh, uh, planning area. Typically it's the same district. Uh, particularly when you see how District 1 and District 2 kind of collaborate, you can be in District 2 trying to make something happen in District 1. It'd be nice if we could open up that a little bit. The second is the match of bedrooms. So a market rate might have two bedrooms. Perhaps with seniors who only need one or studios, there could be a formula that the two could wrap up 
um, or connect with a senior uh, scenario, which would be a different mix. I don't know what that formula is, but I'd love to work with staff to see if we can't find one. I think if we did this, and some of you are aware, um, I'm in a partnership that's actually out of uh, Portland, Oregon. We develop all the way out to Houston, all over the state of California, and so forth. And I can tell you firsthand, a supermodel has never been formulated. I think we have an opportunity to maybe do something unique as a county, and then that might be a model for others in California. The other thing, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, enthusiastic about uh, a uh, enhanced density bonus program, but always remember, typically, as you heard a, a gentleman earlier talk, when a senior comes into a complex, as I'm describing, they typically are leaving a single family home that's now available to the general public. And tragically, we don't count that. So in a way, that's a unique housing opportunity that we provide the county by providing better senior housing. So there may be a formula there. Obviously, the, these are random thoughts, but I really want to uh, kind of open up the discussion. And of course, my focus is also on special needs people. Last thing. Um, I, I know the answer is yes. Uh, consideration for other uh, letters and documentation to come in uh, to uh, advance some of these ideas. And then we are going to be Thank working you. with the uh, housing staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Del Cruz. Good morning. Welcome back. And we did receive your letter, just so you know. Uh, good morning. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. We submitted our comments in writing, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts. Um, one, uh, this is a wonderfully broad list of tools, and I like you using the word tools, um, as that's what they are. But it's a very broad list, and I'd like to point out to you that all five supervisorial districts have something involved in, one of the, in some of those proposals. So it isn't just something that's going to happen only in one place or in another place. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, just part of the contrast of this is that what part of the process that we were trying to go through was what Sibley Simon said, which is to find a way so that private developers can build affordable housing that doesn't cost the taxpayers. Um, and so this is a, this is a wonderful product. Um, competing with that is their own, there are their own challenges. And I just read yesterday that the cost of construction, not including land, has gone up 10% a year for each of the last three years. So hopefully we can get this thing moving and I'd just like to thank you for moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Mr. Willoughby. Good morning, welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Supervisor Leopold, thank you for pulling this off the consent agenda. I can't believe that that's where it was. So thank you and for your good comments. Um, I would like to hear uh, the exact legal case uh, citation that uh, uh, solidifies that this action is not sequa segmentation. I attend as many uh, public meetings as I can, and uh, that includes the county's Housing Advisory Commission and um, water meetings too, but I hear often CEQA referred to as the thing that slows us down. As a member of the public, I have quite a different view. It is um, the public's only avenue for, for input in projects that do critically affect them and their way of life, their quality of life. So I would really appreciate the streamlining that these proposed uh, changes would bring to uh, not remove any public notification, to instead increase public notification and public hearings, especially if you're going to look at something like this uh, intense zoning district with special uh, abilities for developers to get very large density bonuses. I, um, I want to encourage the board to do away with your move to, to accept in lieu payment for the Measure J, 15% inclusionary affordable housing, and make those developers include that housing in their development at its built. The gentleman just said cost of construction goes up 10% annually. Accepting a small amount of money as in lieu fee from developers 
for affordable housing units that they should be building does not get things built, and we've seen that play out. I was at the Housing Advisory Commission meeting when um, staff presented the discussion about uh, rental units in affordable uh, mixes, and it was with some hesitation that the commission accepted staff uh, recommendations not to require rental properties to have similar 15% uh, affordable inclusionary. And the reason for that was given by staff that there aren't, it's not economically feasible for developers, so we're not seeing any come in, and we've got to work out a deal with developers because it's not penciling out. I'd like to know how penciling out is defined and who's making this definition. Is it penciling out in terms of the social implications of having people live in their cars and on the river and all the health effects and things that we're all having to pay for? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Singleton, welcome. Good morning, Chair Friend and the rest of the supervisors. I just wanna say, um, well, first of all, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. We represent about 80 of the largest employers in the county, and our group has seen these recommendations, has been working on them with a coalition of community partners for um, more than six months now, um, and we're very supportive of the list as it is now in terms of helping to ease our housing supply shortfall, make sure we get more units online, um, especially more affordable on-site units, which I think is the goal that everyone is keeping in mind here when looking at these uh, these recommendations. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about the coalition, but the coalition of nonprofit housing developers, housing advocates, um, faith-based organizations, um, and community members have come together. Um, we've had many meetings looking at these recommendations. In terms of the outreach that's been done, uh, there has been extra hearings by both your Housing Advisory Commission as well as these, these organizations. Um, we even purposely scheduled uh, one of these hearings at a later time so that more people who could, could attend who otherwise couldn't because they, you know, are working. Um, we've, uh, as the Business Council, we've worked with MBEP on uh, some events, uh, specifically the last, uh, the Housing 101 event last October. Um, we also produced a video um, that went step by step about what a density bonus is, how it works, and what an expanded program could be like, and then shared that amongst these groups. Um, and we've also enlisted the help of the Housing Advocacy Network, which is a network of over 45 local nonprofits who have vested interest in getting more housing, uh, both the people who live in this community, but also people who work here. Here. Um, so there's a lot of support behind these recommendations and moving them forward as fast as possible. Um, we've done the work to reach a broad coalition of people who are very engaged and who have a vested interest in getting these units online. And so I think uh, that needs to be recognized when, we look in, when we're looking at actually getting something done and in the timeline that we can do that. And in terms of environmental review, um, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know the exact case. Um, I have a lot of faith and deference towards our staff to be able to go here and, and make sure that this process is, is following in line with California law and that environmental considerations have been taken in to account. Um, other jurisdictions that have passed enhanced density bonus program, whether it's Napa, Santa Rosa, or San Diego, have all not had to do full environmental ne negative declarations under CEQA and have been able to do it through a, a shorter term kind of approval process. So if these jurisdictions that are all larger than us are able to pass an enhanced program that's similar to what's being recommended here, then surely there's a way that we as Santa Cruz County can get it done. Um, and so lastly, I just want to say thank you, uh, supervisors, thank you to the Housing Advisory Commission who passed this unanimously, and thank you to our wonderful staff who have been champions for, for getting this program moving, moving forward. So thank you. Mr. Singleton, I, I want to uh, express my thanks. I've, I've watched the video that, that the Business Council put together, and I thought it was very helpful, and I've tried to get it out to others to better understand so I really appreciate that. Um, I think there hasn't really been community meetings uh, outside the Housing Advisory uh, co uh, Committee meeting, which was held one evening in the city of Santa Cruz, and we're talking about something that's going to be affecting the unincorporated area. So that's why I'm trying to encourage us to do more outreach uh, to, better, to help the community better understand these tools, uh, because I think it makes it easier when the projects come in uh, that uh, that that the community understands how these tools can be successful uh, for our community and don't just react negatively to the number of units that are there, and so that's that. I want to encourage. I want to continue to encourage that activity, but I appreciate the work that that you've done in the video that you created. Great, thank you so much. 
Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Garrett. Welcome back. Good morning. I appreciate people's comments here, especially Dr. Ann Lopez. Um, we need affordable housing, low-cost housing for everyone. It's a basic human right. You know, you talk about human rights to have food, clothing, shelter. We hear this all the time. And uh, with all due respect for your efforts for affordable housing, it's just a tiny, addressing a tiny bit of the need of homeless people and poor people and low-income people for housing. And I, I, you know, having taught in Pajaro Valley schools for about 20 years and having gone with Dr. Ann Lopez on some of her tours of the migrant camps and meeting with farm workers and having talked with many of the parents of my school children, because I taught bilingual classes, of their situation, their working conditions. I have great sympathy for the needs and I'm also appalled at the deplorable uh, conditions. And I, I think of that bumper sticker I had when I was teaching. It'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need, and the Air Force have to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. Not only the schools would have money if we were able to take, and I think you need to advocate for this seriously, the money that is siphoned out of this county to go for over half of our tax dollars to military budget and wars of this empire we're living in. We would have money for housing, for schools, for parks, and when we only have a pittance of the pie that's left over of our tax dollars, uh, it, it's very limited on what you can do. So I would, I think we need that kind of advocacy. And in terms of environmental review, wherever we're living, if the environment is toxic, um, that's not going to promote the quality of life. It's going to do the opposite. And I couldn't help but thinking when I had a tour, went on to see a house at the Aptos Village Project and asked, what about the spill of the diesel oil cleanup? Um, wasn't that right here? And I was assured by the realtor it was cleaned up, but I don't know if there's evidence of that. We need a clean Thank environment. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Welcome back. I am Evan Soroki, uh, here to support the um, uh, directing staff to look at these things further. Um, yeah, we're in a housing crisis. We need more housing. And uh, I encourage the supervisors and staff to <clears throat> uh, use this as sort of a jumping point for uh, moving away from slow or no growth policies. And, uh, you know, this county has already grown, and you know, even in the past eight years, it's grown at a rate of 12 people per additional housing unit. And this is mainly as a result of families having kids. Just, you know, families expanding and uh, more people uh, needing homes as they grow up. And so, uh, you know, I think we rightly protected, uh, you know, our environmental resources in places like Alder <coughs> Ranch and, uh, you know, Henry Cowell and, uh, uh, you know, all, all our other great uh, state parks and uh, natural resource areas. And so those should remain protected and as we move forward, though, we need we still need places to live, and you know, going out is probably not a good idea. And so these you know things like density bonuses and allowing more farm worker housing, where people have jobs and where people need to live, is something that's very needed. So uh, yeah, I just encourage you to 
give staff that direction and uh, plan for our future in a good way that allows us to have housing and also, you know, addresses the needs of our uh, future population with, you know, expanded water uh, capacity and uh, better transportation and infrastructure as well. And so, yeah, these are sort of like a good amount of first steps in that trajectory. And I even challenge you to look even further at some of the, you know, height density regulations that we have and if we still need those, if those are outdated and we need to be looking for towards the next 20, 30 years of uh, just growth of families expanding and, uh, you know, people like myself and there, everyone else in here who our families are just growing. We need places to live and we're going to need more homes. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, Mr. Thomas. Good morning. Um, my name is Ken Thomas. I'm a resident of Live Oak. I'm also a COPA leader. Uh, COPA stands for Communities Organized for Relational Action and Power. Uh, we urge you to support staff's recommendation and approve the item. Uh, COPA is, uh, represents 23 member institutions in Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, and San Benito County. Uh, those organizations are all civic organizations comprised of uh, faith communities, labor unions, schools, and nonprofits. Uh, COBA regionally uh, supports the production of low and very low income housing, especially workforce housing. Again, COBA supports the item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work on housing for so many years. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. My name is Jane Crowley. You can pull the microphone down. Oh, thank you. My name is Jane Crowley, and I live in Soquel, and I'm a retired teacher. I've been a long-time resident of Santa Cruz County. I'm fortunate enough to have my children, my grandchildren here, but I see I'm a member also of the COPA team in my faith community, and I see this whole problem of affordable housing for people and decent place to live and to work is a moral issue. And you've heard it before, it's a worldwide problem. Locally, I've seen um, children and families who are couch surfing. They can't afford to live here. When I came here about 32 years ago, I had my job and fortunately, I was able to buy a mobile home it was then kind of expensive, and now things are going up to, quote, whatever the market can bear. And, and, and this is a strange way of looking at housing for, for families. We've seen people, as has been mentioned before, having to move away their teachers, their um, workers in hospitals, and the people who serve us in our tourist industry, they can't live here. They have to commute, wait a long time to get to work, and it's bad for the, the people who employ them and bad for the people themselves. And I do urge you to accept the um, recommendations of the Housing Committee. We need to move forward and look at new ways to live. The world is changing, and we have to do it too. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, uh, Laura Segura, Executive Director of Monarch Services, and we provide services to uh, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking, and we also have an emergency shelter in our county, and um, just really pleased with the efforts of the Housing Advisory Com Commission and the county's recommendation and the work with MBIP in developing strategies um, that are unique to our region and our community. And basically, for, for us, it's been really challenging for our survivors. We give them 30 days in our shel emergency shelter, and then most of the time, because they can't found, find housing, we send them off to another um, shelter until they're able to find more permanent, stable housing. And right now, we are applying for rapid rehousing grants, so hopefully we'll be able to bring in some state and possibly some federal funding into our community to help 
help alleviate with uh, the housing costs and provide some additional support services to our clients. A couple areas to really pay attention to uh, for us is really uh, around multi-generational multi housing, what works in one community may not necessarily apply to another community. For example, in South Housing, in South County, there are many households with multi-generations um, that are multi-generational, uh, especially in the Latino community where we live with the grandparents, and, and so there's different generations that live in one household, so really paying attention to that. And also, um, I really appreciate the local preference policy that the county has, and I think that's really important to avoid displacement, and also when we're thinking about long-term planning, the unintended consequences of our policies, I think that's really important to pay attention to. So I'm really looking forward and really uh, wanting to do more partnerships with the various organizations that can help alleviate our housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your work. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item? Okay, hey, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'll just make some, some brief comments. I'm, I'm supportive of the item actually as a clean uh, item set of recommendations. I do want to just say that um, I want to caution that any additional direction that we provide doesn't actually water down uh, the set of recommendations. So I just want to be sure that uh, we the goal is to pass uh, what we have here and, and whatever additional direction we have, I just want to make sure it doesn't do that. But I, I'll say that it's also really telling to see who has come to the table on during this discussion, at least over the last two years. Uh, there's people who, uh, when you talk about nonprofit leaders, social justice leaders, faith leaders, uh, nonprofit developers, uh, community members that haven't historically been at the table, including some that have actually historically opposed construction of a lot of things in Santa Cruz County, it goes to show you that uh, we've reached uh, you know, a real tipping point in housing within our community and that we can't address the next 30 years using the previous 30 years worth of policy. There were some even in the room today that spoke in favor of affordable housing that have opposed some affordable housing developments that have come forward to the county recently. Um, and I'll say that even in the most recent uh, work that was done at Aptos Village, we had a, um, a lottery done on the Measure J units. We had uh, about 10 times the number of qualified people that are actually pre-qualified for a mortgage that were actually uh, able to get a unit. They're all local residents and all their stories are, are unbelievably powerful. Um, but yet there's still active opposition to that project and other projects. So it's one thing to say that you're in favor of affordable housing. It's another thing that when a project actually comes forward, especially one in your neighborhood, you can find a lot of reasons as to why you don't support it. It's easy to be against things, it's harder to actually be for things, especially if it has a direct impact on your life. But I'd like to, you know, remind the community that, that it's not just, um, it's not somebody else's children, right? I mean, th these are also your kids, your friends' kids, your teacher's kids. Um, and many of us that are fortunate here to own a home, uh, in fact, all of us that actually sit up on this dais should uh, remember the fact that we're making policies for a community of which only half are fortunate enough to own a home, and even those that are struggling, and even those that can't, don't see a possibility by which they'll actually have a future within this community disproportionately uh, in Supervisor Leopold's district, my district, and Supervisor Caput's district. Um, we have to change that cycle and break that cycle, but it means casting votes that aren't politically popular. It means having the community uh, being willing to take things on density, Supervisor Leopold noted, that they may not understand or understand when it actually happens within that area, but we are significantly behind the times on this issue, uh, significantly behind the times both on policy and implementation. We've got a number of good policies on the books, but when it actually comes down to it, uh, we haven't had a lot of good implementation on actual votes to allow these projects to come forward, and I think we need to send a message uh, to nonprofit housing developers and the community at large that we're open for business to breaking this cycle. I mean, we either are or we aren't, and I, I would like to see as a progressive community we actually care about people. Um, equally to other things. And there's a lot of poor people that are struggling in this community. There's actually a lot of working families, a lot of people who wouldn't even be defined as poor in a lot of constructs, but because of the cost of living here, uh, the reality is that they are. Um, I'm comfortable with doing it. I, 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 well, I think people know that. Uh, I've paid uh, certain prices for it, but I think it's the right thing to do because I think that we'll, we'll be able to pass something on to our future generations they deserve. Um, in regards to Dr. Lopez's comments, uh, Supervisor Caput and I represent an area with a lot of farm workers. We've both been to houses that have 20 to 30 people living in them with converted areas underneath stairs and converted chicken coops in the back. Um, 
you don't have to look to other countries to see uh, abhorrent living conditions. They're right here within our own backyard, and, and um, uh, the dichotomy between areas of my district is, is, um, is, is stunning in some respects. When you think about uh, the two most expensive homes that were just featured in the Sentinel are both in my district, oceanfront homes at over $5 million that are for sale in Aptos, juxtaposed against 27% unemployment in a section of freedom that I represent and 17 people living in a 1,000 square foot home. And, I just don't consider that to be the values of a progressive community, and I think that this, to me, I think that this is, is the first step. And so I'm supportive of these actions. I just encourage my colleagues that whatever we do, if there are any amendments that are made, that they don't uh, water down what we're trying to do, because we've got a lot of steps in order to make a difference. But I'd like to move it to the board for an actual motion. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, I, uh, I find uh, a, uh, uh, a lot of support for what you said. I think it makes sense to think about all of our planning processes being in sync um, and, and not uh, try to do things in different ways in different places. Um, I think it, uh, there's a way to build uh, a sustainable environment, um, a, a sustainable housing system, a sustainable transportation system, if we think ahead uh, and actually do the, these pieces. So, I would be prepared to move the recommended, all the recommended actions, and I would add three pieces. Uh, to direct the Public Works Department to work with the Office of Economic Development on the creation of a new transportation and infrastructure funding policy framework that is integrated with associated residential and commercial development impacts on the county's multimodal transportation network. The framework should prioritize that existing or future transportation infrastructure funding resources be used to address development impacts from significant residential or job creation projects that exceed a defined fresh threshold of size and impact. And the new policy should also balance the maintenance needs of the whole county. Um, I would also uh, direct the staff to amend the density bonus program, the county code section 17.12, to include an enhanced density bonus program as an overlay tool that will allow up to 50% units with additional affordability requirements with, within, specific, within specific zone districts or along defined transportation corridors when a project exceeds a specific density th threshold. And lastly, direct the planning staff and county council uh, to meet and draft an environmental review process mem memo to share with members of the board um, so we are fully informed. There's a motion. Is there a second to that item? Okay. Well, it, it, it died for the lack of a second. Is there is there a, a follow-up motion for this know, item? You know that um, I don't. I'm not saying that I disagree with it. I just I just want to get my arms around that, and I need more time than uh, 30 seconds. And I, and I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Leopold, uh, Supervisor Leopold's proposal, but I, I'm. Uh, I think uh, we're we're at this point, and we're, this is going to go into more hearings and so forth. Uh, that I, I, uh, I think we can discuss those types of issues along the way, and I think there's enough in this that we can address those issues at the same time. First of all, I want to I want to congratulate. Uh, the Housing Advisory Commission for presenting a unanimous proposal. I mean, this doesn't happen every day, uh, every week. So uh, I think they've spent a lot of time on it. Um, I think that the county also needs to do its part, and I think it is doing this in a, in a moving target. We have some new um, tools to work with, but I think what's critical is that we have uh, f f to recognize first that builders aren't our enemy. They're, we need them. And we need to have as much predictability in, in regard to uh, time and money, uh, because time is money. Um, when we, one speaker said that uh, this you know, housing increases are going up, the prices are going up 10% a year for the last three years, that, I think that might be low in this county. but. So, and I think we're, we're working toward that end. We're, we've got a more understandable proposal, uh, a, a, a very understandable proposal before us. And so I'd like to see us move forward with that. And I, um, I really want to, I think that the Housing Commission, Advisory Commission really looked ahead in some of these issues about our fee structure being based on square feet rather than the number of units. I think those types of basic things as well as change in the 50-50 rule and commercial residential. Um, very basic, been tried at other places and worked well. So I think we ought to just 
move toward that end. Uh, I just um, am not prepared to accept, and I, I think there's good reasoning behind Supervisor Leopold's proposal, but I just want to take a pause and work with what we have after a lot of uh, in-depth discussion and proposals from the Housing Commission. So I... Um, Supervisor McPherson, do you have a motion then? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to move um, the recommended action from uh, the uh, Planning Director and the Housing Commission, the Advisory Commission of what we have before us, uh, that we move ahead and uh, we're going to look for forward to discussing this in further detail in the fall. We have a motion. Is there a second to the, just the recommended actions? I'll second that. We have a second. Additional discussion, I, Supervisor well, Coonerty, and then Supervisor Leopold. Yeah, I, I um, so one is the tone uh, and tenor of both the emails we got and the people who showed up uh, is remarkably different in the time that I've, since I've started in local government. And I think um, it's both a testament to the organizing and the work that's being done by the people in the room to build broader coalitions to tell a different story about the, the need and impact of housing in our community. It's also a testament to the crisis we're in and the pain that's being felt across the community. And so um, I want to commend the Housing Advisory Committee for and the staff for bringing this set of recommendations forward. I think, uh, I think Supervisor Leopold has good comments uh, and potent these are, well, certainly the legal analysis would need to be done regardless. But um, the other pieces are potentially uh, potential, but uh, as a directing staff to, to proceed uh, when we don't sort of, when all the pieces around the housing haven't been flushed out yet and we don't know the impacts uh, that that both positive and, and potentially negative that may come, it, it seemed premature to, to, to sort of be directing staff to, to a foregone conclusion and to what would be a major change in our some some of our policies uh, around public works funding and other and other programs. So uh, so I'm prepared to move this recommended action day with the idea that both the Housing Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission never seem afraid um, to add their recommendations uh, and uh, and how they think uh, and what would be needed and that we can sort of send it to the community uh, and. Get the and from and our advisory bodies get feedback and then make decisions from there. <coughs> so we do have a motion and a second. Supervisor Leopold, to follow yeah, up. Uh, I understand the concerns my <coughs> colleagues have about trying to think about different ways to do funding, but this is an issue in which we have got to grapple with. That what we've seen is when we see projects, we need those resources. If now is not the appropriate time, we have got to figure out a way. To, to change some of the way we fund in order to be able to provide the infrastructure necessary to support this kind of housing. We are, we are, we are hurting the people who are going to live in, the, in this new housing if they do not have sidewalks to walk on that are wide enough, if they do not have bike lanes, if they don't have uh, the resources to be able to support them living. It does not take away from our, our, our housing strategy to say that we sh they should be accompanied by adequate resources um, uh, t uh, or infrastructure uh, t uh, to be able to support them in these new, these new housing arrangements. And I challenge the, the, the community uh, and our Public Works Department to start thinking about this, and um, I think we're going to need to revisit this item. I hope that it wouldn't be considered, uh, I hope that it would be considered a friendly amendment to direct the planning staff and county council to meet and draft an environmental review process memo to share with members of the board. I think that would be helpful, and I'm wondering if that would be accepted as a friendly amendment. Well, I, I, let me just express something uh, before we ask that question. I mean, generally, we don't direct council to come back with something if they anticipate in the future there could be litigation associated with something that becomes a public document. So, uh, to well, the degree, I, uh, because th this is an item that has actually been presented to us associated with closed session litigation, including a follow up memo from council that explained the disposition, the adjudication of that case, that explained directly why it is this would actually be okay, but that's some months back. So we've actually already received a closed session memo associated with this. I just don't want to have an open session discussion regarding this item. So to the degree that, that you're providing the flexibility to council to provide you with a briefing memo that may be under that context, I think that's reasonable. I understand, uh, uh, Chair, th about the concern about not sharing information that could be used in litigation. That's why I did not direct it to come back as a report to share with a memo with the board. 
um, that's different than, than saying put it on the agenda. I understand the concerns that you bring up, but I think it's important to look. My conversations with staff is that, that there are some issues around general plan, around uh, the, the interpretation of, of what we have to do around the uh, density bonus, um, the, the R combining districts, the farm worker housing, that I think would be useful for us to, um, um, uh, to, to have that information from council. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. I think we could all benefit from it. Um, if, if, the, if it's not accepted as a friendly amendment, I'll ask for the, uh, the, the council to provide to me individually, but I think it would be useful for all of us. Planning director, please. I just wanted to, to note that if such a memo is going to be done, it ought to only be done once the proposals are sort of standing still. We have got a lot of work to do to flesh out what these proposals are, what the content is, and that's the point at which we determine what the appropriate environmental review would be in consultation with county council's office. Well, yeah, I hope that when we get something that there has been adequate uh, uh, communication with council. I don't think that's happened in advance of this. And, and I think that, that it strengthens our hand to have the knowledge of, of the, the fact that we've been up here before and we've said one thing and now we're changing our point of view on that in public. Uh, and I'm just asking for the, uh, the, to ensure that the planning department and the county council is working together uh, to address these issues. Well, it's proposed okay. as a friendly amendment. I'll come to you, Supervisor well, Caput. It's not, you bet. It doesn't appear accepted as a, as a friendly amendment. Supervisor Caput? Well, uh, <clears throat> we're kind of arguing about something we all agree about. So I, I don't see any problem with the amendment. I mean, the amendment is fine. Uh, uh, it's a direction, and uh, it's, a, it's a friendly amendment. So I'll, I'll second the amendment. It has to be accepted by... <laughs> Uh, the makers of the motion. Uh, and I can't do it right now. Well, I, I, I well, could, could make a motion and we could have it. I was hoping yes. it would be accepted as a friendly amendment because it's, it does not change what, what we're doing and I'm asking for legal advice to be shared with all of us. Um, I could make an amendment and we could vote on it, but I'm just hoping it will be accepted friendly. It wasn't accepted. So, Supervisor Caput, do you want to continue with your discussion, or we have a we do have a motion in a second. That we, at some point, it'd be nice to actually yeah. vote on and that. And I would make an motion. Uh, I would make an amendment motion. Right. Okay. We direct uh, uh, planning staff and county council uh, to meet and draft an environmental review process memo to share with members of the board. All right. So we have an am amendment motion. Are you seconding that, yeah, Supervisor I'll second. Okay. We have a second. I'm not in favor of the amendment, but we have to vote on the amendment first. All those in favor of the amendment to the main motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. No. Oh, yes or no? No. Okay. Um, so the amendment fails. Now we'll move back to the, the main motion. All those in favor of the main motion, which is just for the recommended action, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passed. Supervisor Leopold, did you vote? Aye. It passes unanimously. We do have, we're going to take a very, very, very short break because we have a 1045 scheduled item, which is zone five, that we're going to come back to. So we'll take uh, a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll give you an opportunity for the clerk to actually set up the room for zone five. And we'll come back for our 1045 scheduled item. We do have a pulled item on item 59 that we'll hear right after the 1045 scheduled item this time, Runner. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to reconvene. This time we will come back together as the Board of Directors for the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5. If we could have a roll call for Zone 5, please. Director Leopold? Here. Kunitri? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Harlan? Here. Christensen? Chair Friend? Here. Are there any uh, changes to the agenda today for Zone 5? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to Zone 5 Oral Communications, an opportunity for members of the community or the board to address us on items within Zone 5 purview, but within, not on today's agenda. Is there anybody who'd like to address us on uh, Zone 5 Oral Communications? Good morning, Ms. Thank you. Good morning. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Um, I have attended recent Soquel Creek Water District meetings wherein they are discussing studies done by uh, Rambol, a, a Danish company, to assess um, stormwater recharge areas as a possible means of um, pushing back the salt water, fresh water interface. And um, it was discussed that your, your board really needs to be looking at this issue too. 
to incorporate stormwater capture and recharge projects in what you do and for funding. So I would just like to encourage you to work together with Soquel Creek Water District and um, use some of this good information that they have uh, paid for and uh, also can uh, cooperate with Dr. Andy Fisher at UCSE who has identified excellent areas in the county for potential groundwater recharge using stormwater capture. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address this during oral communications? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item two, which is approval of the zone five minutes we have for March 13, 2018. Any changes to the minutes? Is there a motion for the minutes? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Harlan, a second from Coonerty. Anybody from the community like to address us on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item three, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 5 to accept and file the third quarter report on fiscal year 17-18 Zone 5 expansion construction revenues outlined in the memo of the district engineer. Mr. Machado? And first, we'd like to, I think we need to turn your microphone on, so down at the base. At the base. I'd like to also welcome uh, Matt Machado, who is our new Public Works Director and Deputy CAO. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Welcome. Uh, you're also the engineer here for Zone 5, Zone 7, Sanitation District, and about 55 other things, which may have been under the other duties as assigned when you applied <laughs> for the job. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, our members of the Zone 5. Uh, I appreciate your, uh, your support today. Uh, thank you to our other staff, Ms. Coburn, Ms. McRae, uh, the items before you are fairly straightforward. Um, as you mentioned, item three is a request to accept and file the third quarter report of fiscal year 1718 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue. As outlined in our memo, uh, staff is available to answer any questions, and I turn it to the board for your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions from directors on this issue? Uh, seeing none, is there anybody from the community would like to address us on item three? I bring back to the board. I move approval of the recommended action. Second. A motion from uh, Director Leopold, a second from Director Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Moving on to item four, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 5 to authorize a total expenditure of $485 for the Zone 5 Flood Control and Water Conservation District's portion of the Monterey Bay Regional Stormwater Pollution Prevention Television Advertisements as recommended uh, by the Interim District Engineer at the time. We have the TV ad invoice. Is there a brief commentary on a $485 invoice? No additional comment, uh, just uh, we can address any questions you may have. Are there any questions on this advertising campaign? Any member of the community like to address us on this item? Ms. Steinbrenner? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Which TV station <laughs> okay. is the add-on? Thank you. Thank you. We do have the TV stations listed in the background, uh, KIO and Fox, Telemundo and uh, CW. KIO and Fox and Telemundo. And CW. Yeah. And CW. Uh, do we have a motion from board? So moved. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Director Leopold, a second from Director McPherson. All those in favor on item four? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Moving on to item five, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 5 accept and approve the proposed 1819 Zone 5 and Zone 5 expansion construction budgets as recommended by the Interim District Engineer. We have the Zone 5 budget narrative. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Nothing to add. Uh, we are here to answer any questions. Are there any questions on the proposed budget? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, could you just say a little bit more about the 38th Avenue Detention Basin and what that is. Um, the detention basin, the improvements within it was, they were built in the mid-70s and um, we keep monitoring the condition of the electrical and the pump and the piping and always when we have a chance we put some money there for upgrades because the system is old. So basically, uh, there are some rusting pipes there that, that we put some money there to, to replace and upgrade for next fiscal year. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be doing. With yeah, okay. we'll, we'll have an estimate from different contractors and see where we go with that. Okay, Yeah. thank you. You're Director welcome. Harlan. Soquel Creek Water District is looking at that possibly for a recharge area. So are we looking at maybe a hydrology study to do there, or would they be looking at that? 
we are working with Sokyal Creek Water District. Uh, environmental Health is looking into it too, and they have tried to, uh, basically we, we try to understand the soil there to see where we can do, if we can do recharge. So we're working and we're trying to seek a grant, uh, but it's a little, premature because of that, the grant, and because of we don't know the results of that investigation. Uh, but it is being looked at also by environmental health, not just Soquel Creek Water District, in cooperation with the Soquel Creek Water District. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Director Caput, please. Well, just, uh, I, I think it's great. Uh, and I'm thinking of in the future that we actually have something in the board that is actually supporting uh, recharge uh, areas where farmers or ranchers are trying to do something on their land. I think the biggest obstacle we have is not the uh, county and it's not the state of California. It usually is FEMA or it's the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, do you, uh, uh, how, how much pushback do we get making the cost go up for actually trying to promote something uh, for recharge areas where farmers turn it over? How, how much pushback are we actually getting from FEMA? Well, we haven't approached them with that. I think FEMA or uh, various if we're going to see a grant, they, the, this recharge is one of the preferred uh, type of projects for uh, funding such projects. So we haven't asked FEMA to, to do such a project. It's more of like still internal investigation. And I don't see that they're going to push back saying you cannot do recharge. They prefer these kind of projects, uh, what they call multi-benefit instead of just flood control, if we are showing that a project beside doing flood control, it's doing recharges, filtering the water, they prefer these kinds of projects and they like to fund them actually. So we haven't gotten pushback, but we haven't asked for a specific project. We, there's some, I mean, analysis and this one at least there is the property to do recharge. Other locations to do recharge, we need, we need land to do the recharge. Uh, so if we find the land and we f see how much it costs and what we, where, where else we need to re recharge, they would be supportive of that. But it's all of cost-benefit analysis, especially for FEMA. They always want to see the cost-benefit analysis. But right. this location, it doesn't need right of, uh, real property because we have it. So yeah, it wouldn't uh, be yeah, a big deal uh, in that sense. Uh, hypothetically, maybe uh, pushback is not the correct word, but when they, when they come back, when it gets to, uh, let's say, FEMA, uh, do they come back with something that causes the cost of doing this to go way up? It's more of the review process for a project. Uh, I mean, we had recent project that they funded us, but we had to go two and a half years for the review process before they approve the grant. So uh, it's, it can, based on, on what, uh, what environmental issues come up with for the review. Uh, and until we uh, approach them with a specific project, we, we wouldn't know. I mean, basically, just like people like to recharge, other people want the water to go to the creeks. So we have to do that balance in the analysis and what we submit. Yeah, and when the cost does go up, who actually has to pay the, uh, the, higher, the higher amount? It, well, I'll add in there that uh, nearly every project would require uh, environmental review, which is uh, CEQA and NEPA if it's federally funded. And so those costs to do that environmental review would be a project cost. And so we'd have to consider that in developing the scope of any recharge project, whether it's uh, farm fields or existing basins, we'll have to consider that and make that a part of the scope in the cost estimating. Uh, that would be standard process for nearly every project that, that this board would consider. Okay. Director Harlan. I have another question. Um, for the Zone 5 master plan update, what's the timeline for that? Actually, we don't have a, a, a comprehensive master plan update. It's just a small amount of funds we're putting for if we see uh, some uh, am amendment to what we have, but not for going out and seeking uh, a new contract. Uh, so we have some money there for if we see errors in the master plan, if we want to model it for uh, what else can be done in the, in, within the current model that we have. So, but it's not to amend the master plan. I would add though, I, I did, even though I'm the newcomer here, 
I did uh, review the Zone 5 master plan. It was developed in 2013. And so it's not really out of date yet, but I do think it's a item that we should discuss and develop a scope and cost. Uh, and I noticed that the prior master plan uh, went back, I think it was about eight years prior. And so we're probably getting close to that point to have that discussion, but it certainly would be a, a larger cost than the budgeted item of $10,000. And so uh, in the future board meetings, uh, we can certainly bring that back and have that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I move approval of the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from uh, Director Leopold, a second from Director Caput. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now conclude our zone five. I'd like to thank Director Harlan for coming up for Capitola for this meeting. And we'll move back to the regular Board of Supervisors meeting. We had a pulled item 59, which became 75.2. Item 59, which is authorized interim director of public works to sign an amendment to the subdivision agreement with Aptos Village LLC for track 1561. Direct the clerk of the board to submit the amendment for recording and take related actions as recommended by public works. Ms. Steinbrenner, you pulled this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I would first like to point out that both the binder in the back and the binder in the um, clerk's office is missing the copy of the subdivision agreement that has expired. So uh, the documentation is incomplete for the public to view here. But I read it, I was able to go to the library and read it online, and I see that the subdivision agreement between the county, uh, specifically Public Works, and the Aptos Village project developers expired on December 17th of last year. I saw that um, no correspondence from the county went to address that issue until uh, then Director Presley sent a letter to Barry Swenson Builder in the end of March of this year. Technically, there should have been no work going on because, um, and, and I would like to right here ask that you call up uh, Department of Public Works and County Council to weigh in on this uh, before you make any decisions here today. Because in the original subdivision agreement on page five, it says, if the subdivider fails to complete work and improvements within the specified period of time, and that time expired on December 17th of 2017, subdivider shall not proceed any further with such work and improvements unless and until approval to do so is obtained from the county. So I did not see any uh, documentation in there earlier than Mr. Presley's March 2018 letter to Barry Swenson, and I see no approval. So I think what you have to do today is to issue a stop work order at the Aptos Village Project to uphold the county's uh, requirements, which Ms. Miller uh, agreed in a, 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 a writ of mandamus um, proceedings before Superior Court Judge Burdick, the county would do. The county would be better at doing that, and he ascertained that, and she said the county would be better at upholding county requirements at the Aptos Village Project. I have concerns that one of the requirements to secure further funding with travelers only names one of the many parcels of the Aptos Village Project. I have concerns that um, there is never any indemnification certification regarding the Parade Street crossing with the CPUC uh, that was supposed to be in the conditions of project approval. That was never done by Public Works and the approval for the new Parade Street crossing with CPUC has expired. It is expired. So there are many issues, including property boundary disputes, the Swensons, if Lynn Engineer could not find three monuments that Ms. Locke's surveyor did, and she will tell you about that. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Does anybody else like to, to like to address us on this item? Good morning. Welcome, Ms. Locke. My name is Christina Locke, and I am the Bayview Hotel in Aptos, and uh, next to the project that's going on by Barry Swenson. Uh, so I'm asking you not to approve, um, because until the property is, and the boundaries disputes are resolved, and the ingress and egress 
by um, uh, CUP, um, PUC, sorry, um, are re all resolved. I have not heard from Swenson developers or the county. So Public Works needs to come up and to address this uh, podium uh, and me regarding the issues uh, that have not been addressed regarding, again, my um, the property boundaries that erroneously continued on an encroachment on my property. And when I had to hire a, um, uh, a surveyor to come out and re-survey uh, the property, uh, and you found that the monuments were incorrect and that is not on record and I, it should be on record before this is uh, continues. Uh, and of course the, the ingress and egress that uh, is supposed to go on and that has not been approved yet uh, and Public Works has not come up with a solution or addressed me, neither developer or the Public Works have addressed me regarding this, these two issues which really are important to take away the ingress and egress of the, of the, of the um, Aptos uh, Bayview Hotel. So I think it's really important, I think you should look at it and I think that uh, I, you should not approve it. Thank you. Thank you, anybody else like to address us on this polled item? Marilyn Garrett, 37 year resident of Aptos, and um, what you've been asked to do just now by Becky Steinberger and Christina Locke is I think it's incumbent upon you to follow their um, recommendations here. The work, um, there should be a stop work up, uphold, upheld because the county's own requirements that were just read to you are not being met. Now, if an individual homeowner like me were to not meet requirements, the county, I were not to meet requirements, the county would stop me. You need to do this, uh, stop work on this. And the other question is of the property boundaries of where the development is and the Bayview Hotel. And, th and thank goodness that's the only tree left in the area in front of the Bayview Hotel. Thank you for that. Um, the property boundaries, as measured recently by a surveyor, have not been recorded. So the egress entry and exit here is being, um, it's, it's, you know, impinging on the rights of the Bayview Hotel owner. And I would like the public works director to come up here and address these issues or at the least, you should stop this legally. Please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on this item? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Does the board have any questions specifically to this item? And if not, is there a motion? Seeing no questions, is there a motion? Move approval. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty. Is there a second? Second. Second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes no. unanimously. We'll move on to item 76, which is a public hearing uh, to consider 2018-19 benefit assessments for various county, pub uh, very, various county service areas, request submittal of ballots, and continue the public hearing to June 26, 2018 to offer tabulation and certification of the ballots. As outlined in the memo of the interim director of public works, we have the proposed rates for CSA 23, 28, 36, and 59. Mr. Machado, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. Uh, Matt Machado, Director of Public Works and your newest Deputy CAO. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing uh, to consider a district initiated rate increase for the four uh, CSAs. Uh, staff is available to answer any questions. Uh, we do have four recommended items of action. Uh, the first is to open the public hearing and hear objections or protests. Uh, the second is to request a submittal of all ballots of the proposed 1819 benefit assessments. Uh, the third is to close the public testimony portion of the public hearing. And the fourth is to continue the public hearing to June 26, 
to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballots. Are there any questions before we open up the public hearing? Okay. We'll open up the public hearing regarding this item. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Remember, the action here is to continue the public hearing to June 26, 2018. Do we have a motion for the recommended actions? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item 77, which is a public hearing to consider the 2018-2019 CSA benefit assessment rate service charge reports for various county service areas to adopt a resolution confirming the benefit assessment service charge reports for various county service areas as outlined in the memo from Public Works. We have a resolution confirming benefit assessment service charge reports for various CSAs and the attachment A includes the various CSAs. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing to consider assessments to 39 CSAs as listed in your board letter. Uh, there are two recommended actions. The first one is to hold a public hearing to hear objections or protests, uh, if any, to the proposed 2018-2019 benef benefit assessment service charge reports uh, for those 39 CSAs. And the second requested recommended action is following the public hearing to adopt the resolution confirming the benefit assessment and service charge reports for various CSAs. Staff is available to answer any questions. Any questions from board members on this item? I will now open the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on item uh, 77? Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos and member of CSA 33. I've spoken to your board a number of times and I've spoken to LAFCO a number of times and um, I'm happy to report that finally, Earthworks Paving did get paid in full, I understand, in talking with my CSA liaison officer for the work that they did in my community in 2016. There are real problems with public works and I am, um, I am happy that we have Mr. Machado here to guide us through um, and I want to ask that um, Public Works have a meeting with all CSA liaison officers. There's a real communication breakdown. And um, I have been in contact with a number of other CSA liaisons. And this process that used to work so well is not working now. <laughs> so um, I am encouraged that Ms. Elsa Aguilar is now back in charge of CSA, at least I understand she is. She is very uh, easy to work with and is a good communicator, but this, this process has real problems. And as I have said before publicly, the CSA members are very concerned that because of all the problems and Case in point, the, the two-year payment to Earthworks contractors for work that they did um, makes it a challenge for those in the CSAs to find companies that are willing to bid on our work. And that is concerning. It, it affects our property values. It affects our safety and health. So I would like to ask that the new director of public works call a meeting with all CSA liaison leaders and resolve this working with some of the local contractors that do bid on issues. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this during this public hearing? Uh, seeing none, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action on item 77. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Leopold for the recommended actions on this hearing. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item 78, which is a public hearing to consider County Service Area 48 and County Service Area 4 Fire Protection Assessment Service Charge Reports for fiscal year 2018-2019 as recommended by the Director of General Services. Uh, we have a resolution establishing the assessment CSA 48 and CSA 4. Are there any questions from board members before we open up this public hearing? Seeing none, we'll now open up the public hearing for uh, CSA 48 and CSA 4 for the Fire Protection Assessment Service Charge Reports for 2018-2019. Good morning. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, um, resident of rural Aptos and also in the SRA area for CSA 48. Um, I again ask that your board um, 
with budget hearings coming up next week, that you consider um, ameliorating the division of Pro state proposition 172 public safety monies that come to our county, it's over $17 million, that you uh, shift a higher percent of that to the fire service, to county fire service. Right now only 0.5 of a percent goes to the county fire chiefs association being passed through county fire. County fire gets zero. That has to change. And Supervisor McPherson, I have heard you in a public meeting say you are interested in um, supporting a new fire, a rural fire tax. Well, I, I appreciate your concern for the safety of rural residents, but the money is here already in Proposition 172. It's all going to law enforcement, and that was not the intent of that bill when it was passed. So regarding the funding for County Service Area 48, I am supportive of these, this increase, but I also want this board to shift at least 30% of Proposition 172 money to County Fire for a safe community, fire safe community. It will affect us all if we have a conflagration similar to the wine country. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on the public hearing for item 78? Good suggestions, Becky Steinberger puts before you all, all the time. You know, we lived in a common sense place and weren't um, directed by real moneyed interests. People would say, oh, that's an important point you bring up, or these requirements aren't being met, or we need to do such and such for prior protection. Let's look into that and let's do that. Instead, almost consistently, somebody has some excellent research and direction for you, and it's like, this is a formality, this is a facade where we're standing here and you're pretending to represent the public. Now, one crucial factor on fire and fire protection has to do with the power lines. And I just was listening yesterday on KPFA News, the Cal Fire Report on the Northern California Santa Rosa fires. And the implication, I, I don't have the language, I want to get a printout, of PG&E with failure to provide safety and to meet requirements for power line safety. And in every incident of the fire, PG&E was implicated. And on the polls here, we have similar problems, they're overloaded with equipment, like in the Malibu fires of 2007, they blow over, they catch on fire. Verizon was one of the corporations with their devices on these overloaded poles. There are the so-called smart meters, which have a history of catching fire that are on these poles. So we know this is fire, this causes fires with this kind of infrastructure we have. And the fires cause huge damage, we know, and uh, destruction and death. So we need to look at this infrastructure and what we can do to not have these causative factors. I, it's so disturbing to me how the board members shrugging their shoulders like nothing we can do, and you talk about protecting the public and preventing fires, but the reality is some major factors that you could take major direction to stop it, you're not doing. Very, very disconcerting, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this during this public hearing on CSA 48 and CSA Area 4? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion from the board? Approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed, it passes unanimously. Move on to item 79, which is a public hearing to consider the 2018-2019 benefit assessment service charge reports for various sanitation county service areas and adopt a resolution confirming the 18-19 benefit assessment service charge reports. As outlined in the memo of public works, we have a resolution service charge reports, a summary of service charge reports and electronic service charge reports. Good morning, welcome back, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to introduce Kent Edler. He is our Provisional Assistant Director of Special Services. Kent will provide a brief report on this board item. Thank you, Mr. Edler, welcome. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. On May 8th, your board adopted resolutions confirming benefit assessment rate reports for Sanitation County Service Areas 2, 5, 7, 10, and 20. Your board also set today as the date and time for a public hearing on the proposed benefit assessment service charge reports. We're recommending that your board adopt the public hearing and or open the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed 2018-2019 benefit assessment service charge reports. Close the public hearing and adopt resolutions confirming the 2018-2019 benefit assessment service charge reports for the various county service areas. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Are there questions from supervisors on this item? Okay, we'll now open the public hearing on the benefit assessment reports for various sanitation county service Areas. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us during this public hearing? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? I move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to item 80, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution confirming fiscal year 2018-19 benefit assessment service charge reports for county service area 12, which is the wastewater management, as outlined in the memo. Uh, the interim director of health services, we have a resolution confirming the assessment service charge reports for fiscal year 18-19 in CSA 12. Good morning, Mr. Ricker. Good morning, John Ricker, uh, Water Resources Division Director in Health Services Agency. Uh, I'll keep it very brief, given your agenda today. Uh, these are the recommended service charge reports for County Service Area 12, which relates to on-site wastewater management septic systems affecting some 23,000 parcels in the county. Um, the charges were laid out in a previous board item. We're now recommending that you conduct the public hearing uh, to hear uh, support objections or protests, if any, to the proposed fiscal year 2018-19 assessment service charge reports for County Service Area 12 and close the public hearing and then that you adopt the resolution confirming the proposed uh, fiscal year 2018-19 assessment service charge reports for County Service Area 12. Thank you. Are there any questions on CSA 12 by board members? We'll now open up the public hearing. Anybody like to address us on CSA 12? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Move the uh, recommended action. Second. A motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item 81, which is the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, a public hearing to consider the 1819 Freedom County Sanitation District sewer service charge report to close the public hearing and adopt. Uh, the resolution confirming the 1819 sewer service charge report is outlined in the memo of the interim district engineer. We have a resolution confirming the service charge report for Freedom County Sanitation District, the summary of the charges and electronic service charge reports. Mr. Edler. Good morning again. On May 8th, your board adopted in concept an ordinance establishing sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Your board also set today as the date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports. We are recommending that your board open the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed 2018-2019 sewer service charge report for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Close the public hearing and adopt a resolution confirming the 2018-2019 sewer service charge report for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Are there any questions or comments from board members? I'd just like to thank you for your work in the Freedom County Sanitation District, especially with the recent um, designation and the grants that we know are upcoming. It's very important to the work that you're doing down there for disadvantaged communities. So thank you, Mr. Edler, on that. Is there anybody, uh, I would like to open the public hearing. Uh, would anybody like to address us on item 81 for the Freedom County Sanitation District? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Bring it back the to the board. recommended action. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second <coughs> from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? It passes unanimously. We move on to item 82, which is the Board of Directors of the Davenport Sanitation District, a public hearing to consider the 2018-19 Davenport County Sanitation District sewer and water service charge reports and adopt a resolution confirming the 1819 sewer and water service charge reports as outlined in the memo of the interim district engineer. We have a resolution confirming the sewer, sewer service charge report, summary of water and sewer service charges, and the electronic service charge reports. Mr. Edler. Similarly to the previous item, on May 8th, your board adopted in concept ordinances establishing sewer and water service charges for the Davenport, Davenport County Sanitation District. Your board also set today as a date and time for a public hearing on the sewer, sewer service charge reports and water service charge reports. We are recommending that your board adopt the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed 2018-2019 sewer and water service charge reports for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Close the public hearing and adopt resolution confirming the 2018-2019 sewer service and water service charge reports for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Thank you. Questions? All right. We'll now open the public hearing. Anybody like to address us on the Davenport issue? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring back to the board for action. Move approval. Second. A motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 83, which is to consider the June 2018 traffic and engineering report to consider ordinance and concept amend amending the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 9.08 relating to speed limits. Direct the clerk of the board to schedule the final adoption of the ordinance for the next available agenda and take related actions as outlined in the memo. The interim director of public works. We have the ordinance, a clean copy, the summary of changes, June 2018 traffic and engineering report. Good morning, Mr. Wiesner. Good morning, uh, chair and board members. Uh, I'm Steve Wiesner, Department of Public Works and the Transportation Division, and I have a brief presentation for the June 2018 uh, traffic and engineering report. Uh, we present these reports to your board from time to time to provide updated studies uh, for roads that have existing radar enforcement speed limits, roads uh, that are recommended for changes to their uh, previously set radar enforced speed limits, and for new road segments that previously have had no radar enforced speed limits. Um, I'm just going to outline a, very, a few very basic concepts. Uh, our, uh, you know, our speed laws are governed by the California Vehicle Code, um, and the basic speed law um, is that no, no person shall drive a vehicle upon a highway at a speed that is greater um, than is reasonable or prudent having regard for weather, visibility, traffic, and in no event at a speed which endangers the safety of persons or property. So in other words, a driver violates the basic speed law if he or she is driving at un unsafe speeds even if that speed is lower than the posted regulatory speed limit. Um, and you may have heard this term, but it gets thrown around here and there, it's called pre prima facie speed limits. It's a term that refers to a speed limit that applies when no other specific speed limit is posted. Um, in our state, it's 15 miles an hour for uncontrolled railway crossings, blind and uncontrolled intersections, and in business and residential areas and school zones, senior centers, typically in urban areas, it's 25 miles an hour. So um, in order for traffic courts to accept the posting of radar enforcement speed limits uh, by the California Highway Patrol, a traffic and engineering report that studies individual road segments must be produced. This is what you have before you today. Uh, the, re the report must incorporate sound, repeatable methods that conform to the California Vehicle Code and basic engineering principles as well. Um, uh, we establish speed limits near or at the 85th percentile. This is the speed that's been shown that it conforms to the actual behavior of the majority of drivers. Um, so once the traffic engineering report's done, it's valid for uh, five years and can be ex extended for seven and even up to 10 in some cases. Okay. Once approved by your board, the signed originals of these reports are sent to the traffic courts and law libraries for reference by the courts and, and by the public. Um, and in the report that we're presenting today, uh, there are six road segments that we studied. Uh, four of the road segments were set in prior year documents and no change in speed limits are, are recommended for these roads. Um, we do have two roads, however, uh, which had never been studied before, never been po posted for speed limits. And uh, we do have recommendations uh, for speed limits to be set for safe speeds on those roads. The first one is Pine Flat Road. This is in the northern area of our county. And we studied the segment between Martin Road and Comstock Lane and we came up with a recommended radar enforced speed limit of 45 miles an hour here. And uh, the other one is in the southern part of our county. This is Varney Road. And we studied the segment between Amesti Road and Coralitos Road. And we have a recommended radar enforced speed limit of 35 miles an hour for this. 
Um, so with that, the recommended actions today are for your board to consider and file um, the June 2018 traffic and engineering report. Consider approval of ordinance and concept amending the various sections of the county code um, in chapter 9.08 speed limits. Direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance amendment on the next available agenda for final adoption. And finally, uh, direct Public Works to post the necessary changes to the speed limits 31 days after final adoption of the ordinance. All right, so this is the end of my very brief presentation. Um, with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Wiesner. Are there questions? Supervisor Caput. Yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of the one on uh, Amesti and uh, Varney. Uh, that's all, a lot of people take that as kind of a shortcut to uh, Bradley School. That's right. Yeah, and uh, Cordelitas Road. So yeah, I, I guess the only problem I have with it, I'm going to move uh, for approval, uh, is that enforcement is the key to the to key to the key to everything. Correct. And I've seen with uh, Mount Madonna Road where it comes into uh, Casserly, uh, we opened up uh, Hazel Dell, and uh, people were some people were real happy that the. Uh, that they were able to get uh, back onto Mount Madonna Road and get to where they have to go. But then there's other people saying that now their cars are speeding by and all that. So CHP does have uh, authority. The, are they the only ones who can give a ticket? So they have primary responsibility for traffic enforcement throughout our county. Um, uh, the sheriff's office, the sheriff's, deputy sheriffs can uh, cite folks for traffic violations they typically don't it's not their primary focus sure yeah but they can if if they feel the need right so uh i guess what the point i'm making is it would be real nice if uh, the chp could actually give a you know a look there and and see 35 is actually being generous there are a lot of blind turns and blind corners on that road so um yeah, I, I just would, if we're going to move to approve, uh, that we're also moved to approve uh, that they actually it, try to enforce it a little bit better there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of the reasons why we're fairly judicious about setting speed limits on our real, rural roads um, is because it does saddle CHP with more work to get out there and do the radar enforcement. That's true. Yeah, so we, we try to be careful. We work with them. Um, we take their recommendations as well. Right. Okay, so I'm, I move for approval. Are there any other questions? And then we'll open it up to the public. Then we'll come back to you, Supervisor Caput. No other questions. We'll now open it up to the community. Is there anybody who'd like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board, Supervisor Caput. You'd like to move the recommended actions? Yes. Second from Supervisor McPherson. It's also important that we wouldn't even have something enforceable without this speed survey. So you actually need that for the current roads to be surveyed all the same. So it's an important tool for the CHP. It doesn't even add more work to them. All those in fa favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. I'm sorry. Thank Super. you for your work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for that, Supervisor Leopold. We'll move on to item 84, which is to consider the proposed Santa Cruz County strategic plan for 2018 through 2024 and direct the CAO or the County Administrative Office anyway to return on June 26, 2018 with the final strategic plan for board approval as outlined in the memo of the CAO. Ms. Coburn, are you going to lead this discussion? I will. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome thank you. and thank you for stepping in today. We do appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair Friend and members of the board. Um, I'm joined here by Sven Stafford and Nathalie Flores from my office who are going to assist with the presentation this afternoon. I guess it's afternoon now. Um, I'm Assistant County Administrative Officer Nicole Coburn, and I'm here to provide a brief presentation. As you know, the strategic planning effort has been a year-long process. Over the course of the year, we've engaged with thousands of community members, partners, and employees. As I go through the presentation, I'd like to share a few of their stories. I'll start with Rachel, who lives in Live Oak. On March 26, we received an email from Rachel. She had taken our initial community survey and we were following up with her to ask about her interest in participating in a focus group. She wrote, hi, I'm moving out of the county because our apartment was sold and the new owner evicted us. We weren't able to buy anything that would fit our family for $600,000. We are now in Monterey County. My husband will have to commute to Santa Cruz, so I guess our interest would be in transportation, something to decrease the commute time via northbound one in the morning. Rachel's experience is not unique. It is for people like Rachel and thousands of others who echoed those same concerns over the past year 
that we propose a new vision and mission for Santa Cruz County. Our vision is who we want to be. Santa Cruz County is a healthy, safe, and more affordable community that is culturally diverse, economically inclusive, and environmentally vibrant. And our mission is how we intend to get there. An open and responsive government, the County of Santa Cruz delivers quality data-driven services that strengthen our community and enhance opportunity. Coming up with these seemingly simple statements was an enormous effort, especially as the county had never before developed a strategic plan. So how did we get here? Constructing the first countywide strategic plan started with the vision of our new county administrative officer, Carlos Palacios. We then convened a strategic plan steering committee with representatives from various areas of county government. We met weekly to develop the strategic planning process, including a website, employee mixers, community forums, the first community survey. We drafted the strategic plan elements. And finally, we affirmed and refined these elements following a second community survey, employee focus groups, and targeted outreach. What were the results of all that input? Well, let's start at the beginning. Our vision talks about safety and affordability, and those were the top two vision words from the community. The top two values that people expect from the county were integrity and transparency. The steering committee incorporated those principles and more to make a statement about what everyone should expect when they interact with the county. Nine proposed values are shown here. It's envisioned that the county will provide services and support partnerships built on these values. After we had a draft vision, mission, and values, we took the next step to say how we should focus our energy. I don't think the top trends are surprising, and I would like to provide a little context for each based on the comments we, re we received. In the housing category, Dell from Santa Cruz County wrote, teachers, police officers, firemen, city employees, mail carriers, blue collar workers and our children cannot afford to live in Santa Cruz County due to exorbitant rents. Our schools have trouble hiring teachers, working people are becoming homeless. Many can only afford to live in Watsonville, which contributes to Highway 1 gridlock. Similarly, related to transportation, Jenny of Watsonville wrote, our county needs more housing in order to meet the demand of the population that already lives here. We also need to improve the traffic on Highway 1 which disproportionately affects people from Watsonville, Aptos, and Pajaro Valley. In the safety and health category, Alejandra from Santa Cruz wrote, more mental health support for individuals in between services, high focus on crisis support and suicide prevention since these services are often needed for people who can't access other services or in between homes. Related to the economy, Casey from Aptos wrote, find more opportunities to collaborate with the business sector in producing innovative solutions that increase economic vitality for our region. And in, the, and in the environment category, Margaret from Boulder Creek wrote, imagine what we want to be like in 50 years when there are more impacts from climate change, fewer people, different economics, and whole new technologies. Prepare for who might be disenfranchised and what social safety net might be needed. Strive to create a community where each generation can find a, a place in the fabric of the community. I want to take a, a minute to talk about the relative importance related to North and South County. For instance, um, let me point out that transportation and the economy ranked higher in the southern portion of the county. Graham of Aptos wrote, there are no jobs in the county to sustain the cost of housing. The lower cost, higher density housing is in South County where jobs are not. The transportation infrastructure does not support that. So you have a bunch of people living in South County, working in San Jose or Santa Cruz, with no good way to get to either. We need to have better jobs where people live or higher density, more affordable housing, closer to where the jobs are, or much better transportation between where people commute. In operationalizing this plan, we want to be intentional about meeting regional needs and balancing services for all residents. We took the top trends, added operational excellence based on the input of employees, 
and went a little further down the road, developing four goals in each focus area. We passed out a handout today with all 24 goals, so hopefully you have that and can refer to it. I just wanted to present a goal for each of the areas shown here, and I'll go through each one. Behavioral health. Affordable housing. Regional mobility. Natural resources. Regional workforce. And continuous improvement. Now that we have this plan, where do we go from here? We plan to develop a two-year operational plan and budget. The plan is going to include objectives that provide specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely actions that work towards our goals. And we'll also develop tactics that represent activities and steps necessary to achieve each ob objective. We're going to be developing these elements this next fiscal year starting in July, and we'll ask the board to approve them a year from now in June of 2019. We'll also continue the County Leadership Academy to train our employees and encourage participation in implementing this strategic plan. Our first cohort of 10 participants in the Academy are going to be completing their CSAC Senior Executive Credential by this December, and the CSAC program is gonna be on site beginning in January of 2019, and we'll have 30 employees enrolled in that program. Under the leadership of Assistant CAO Elisa Benson, we're going to be elevating the Continuous Process Improvement Initiative to enhance the delivery of county services. We'll also launch performance measurement to quantify impact, support data-driven decision-making, and inform the budget and policy-making process. Pilot projects are planned for this next fiscal year starting in July as well. I just wanted to acknowledge um, a number of people and groups who have contributed to this work and provided contributions. County residents and community partners, the Board of Supervisors and county staff, our uh, county administrative officer, Carlos Palacios, all of the members of our strategic plan steering committee, staff within the county administrative office who have supported the development of this plan, and our strategic planning facilitators. Finally, in closing, I just wanna thank Carlos and the board for the opportunity to lead this project. It really has been an incredible experience as both a resident of the county and an employee of the county. Uh, while engaging with thousands of people around the county, I consistently felt their excitement with the direction we're taking. And I know that our office is especially excited to operationalize this plan. So with that, I want to recommend that the board accept and file our report on the proposed Santa Cruz County strategic plan and direct staff to return in two weeks with the final strategic plan for board approval. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, Nicole, I, uh, I want to ex express my appreciation for your leadership on this initiative. It's unfortunate that uh, our CAO isn't here today. I know it was his vision uh, to do this, but you are the one who are car is carrying this out um, and uh, leading the, uh, these meetings and um, uh, interacting with the public and trying very hard to include many voices in uh, in 20 words or less. So that is, that's a difficult job that we've handed you and I appreciate the work that you've uh, put into it. I, I also appreciate all the members of our county staff and the community who have taken the time to attend meetings, to fill out surveys, and uh, to provide feedback and participate in focus groups uh, because uh, it's, in it's important that we reach beyond just the five of us or our department directors or executive leadership. We should really, if, the, if this program is gonna reflect the community, it needs to be of the community. And I think you've done a very good job um, in ensuring that we can, that we hear those voices. And I know that I've worked with the individual members of the public who have 
come to you and shared information, um, and you have been responsive. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated in this. Uh, it was a fantastic PowerPoint presentation to boot. So uh, uh, we're off to a good start. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, sorry, I want to echo this, the, the same sentiments. Uh, the outreach has been wonderful, and you know what this process really does is uh, it focuses the conversation and it focuses the work uh, so that then we can start doing the, the really hard work of setting these goals and, and implementing them uh, and tracking them, but I think um, the commitment of everyone who's been involved in this pro project uh, to get as many voices into that process as possible, to include uh, every level of uh, the county staff uh, in this has been, has been really tremendous. I have one small change I'd like to suggest on the behavior health. Um, I've tried to, to just participate more in the process uh, with language, but this one um, struck me as I was reading through it, which is under behavioral health, uh, under the comprehensive health and safety that um, support res residents and then I would add and lessen community impacts through reduced stigma and increased access. Um, so just recognizing that, um, that there's both the, the individual and then there's the broader community and both need, it, need to be addressed. So the, the language would be uh, and lessen community impacts. Okay, Supervisor I McPherson. Did, yeah, I, this is, I just want to congratulate everybody who has participated in this. This has been a long time in coming and will guide us for a long time into the future. And it's something that we're going to, and I, I know I certainly will look at and say, okay, wh what is our direction, our general direction? It's very helpful, um, it, not terribly surprising, but it's, uh, it's a very good format for us to be following. Um, we just want to create a, a healthy and safe and more affordable community for the residents of the county. And I appreciate everything that you've done to, to lead this effort. Supervisor Caput. You bet. I, I appreciate your work on this also. And I, I think it's really important that uh, we do have a vision. And uh, like the uh, friendly amendment I seconded, uh, you know, earlier, uh, it kind of, it says right here, provide generalized statements of what the community or the board wants to achieve consistent with the vision. And uh, maybe, um, you know, sometimes we need to actually put that in an in a, uh, amendment to make sure that we're kind of focused on looking at everything rather than, uh, well, we'll take care of it later. So it kind of puts it out there and it makes it, you know, clear to the public and everybody else that uh, this is what we're working towards. We're trying to, you know, look at everything, but it, it helps focus a little bit. Uh, everything we do has something else that it affects, and sometimes we need to, uh, you know, focus and put that in there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to open it up for the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the strategic plan. This would be your opportunity. Please feel free to step forward. Item 84. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and waiting today, by the way. Hi, I'm Colleen Douglas. I am very excited to be here today for the strategic plan. I am really um, very appreciative that the vision has been expanded from the last time I saw it to include a community that is culturally diverse, economically inclusive, and environmentally vibrant. The, the words diverse and inclusive were really important to South County people in particular, and I am very excited that they're in the vision. In order to provide data-driven services for the county, you need to have performance measurements that are gonna be developed based on the goals. Because diverse and inclusive were included in the vision relatively recently, they don't have their own focus area. And I don't know that they need their own focus area, but perhaps they do but they at least need a way to measure them. They need a way to have data-driven services that guide us toward that aspect of the vision as well. And there, 
There are ways, I mean, I did a little bit of research online. There's a new report from the Urban Institute on inclusive recovery in U.S. cities. So they're talking about inclusion, uh, economic inclusion as well as racial inclusion, and um, it's just from like last month. What a lot of the focus areas like education, housing, economic development, fiscal policy, those areas in particular were mentioned in this report as areas where inclusion can be measured. They're focusing, and I, I really want some measurements because what gets measured gets done. What gets measured gets done. That's. That's just the truth. Because these were added more recently, they're not in there as a place for measurement. So I'm happy to give you a reference here. I'm happy to work with you if, if you want that. But um, I'm, I'm very excited about the direction it's going. Thank you so much. Oh, I have 30 seconds. I'm going to just read the last, <laughs> the last part of their conclusion on this report. Selecting inclusion metrics to monitor over time would help city leaders and their partners understand inclusion goals and keep them in mind as priorities shift. And these inclusion metrics should be selected in collaboration with the community. An inclusive process of choosing inclusion metrics ensures they're measuring the correct outcomes and community members feel ownership. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank you for the comments. We agree, which is actually why we're coming, there'll be items coming forward to us within the next year that will outline these performance metrics that we'll be addressing as we transition also into a two-year budget cycle that can have performance metrics based on uh, funding directly tied to those things. So we're, we're on board. It's just a, a transition period right now, and I appreciate those comments. Good but Ms. Morning. Douglas, if you, if you would like to share that with uh, Ms. Colburn, uh, uh, that would be great. I'm sure she'd want to be interested in that. All right, good morning or good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> good to be here. I want to say I'd waited a long time to see a blueprint and great job. Uh, anything that I might see as strategies, that process is most key. I just want to, as you remember, John, you brought up the 32, uh, the 2200 of how few took the time for the Latino Hispanic community. Uh, I'd just like between now and, and the next presentation to see what staff has done to make sure that those residents are included in the process. And I wondered if the uh, PowerPoint is online. I do appreciate seeing the whole plan and what a great team that you have. This is one resource I only brought back about eight and I've handed them out, but there's outside resources that can help us meet the goals. So I would direct staff to, I, I certainly have mine, but to do research. This is a particular one, which one of the workshops I attended, I'm gonna share, uh, is uh, developing the next generation of social justice leaders. And what they have at UC Berkeley is 34 Latinos in a physical residence where they give them leadership training. And again, you can't transfer in two, three minutes what is applied research. But I really invite you on staff and the board to check out greenlining.org and see if there's a transfer of knowledge as particularly they have worked for 25 years in to communities of color. But I thank you and hope that I, before I can get that answer of whether the PowerPoint is on the county online and your whole plan is, I want to say thank you. Hope I can make a contribution in the area of a plan or a design for youth development countywide. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that'd like to address us on the strategic plan? Okay, we'll see none. We'll bring it back to the board. It is online. It is online, and we can make the presentation available online as well. And the link is directly on the front page of, this, of the county website. So I'll move the recommended action uh, with the change uh, to the behavioral health uh, goal. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. 
A second, motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Uh, you've done outstanding work on this project, and the whole team has. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We are going to squeeze in this one last item before we do our, our break, which is um, item 85, which is to consider the coastal encroachment policy and proposed fee schedule to consistently and effectively maintain, operate, and enforce coastal trail and beach access and direct staff to return. During the 2018-19 budget hearings, we'll propose updates on the unified fee schedules outlined in the memo of the Director of Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services. We have the coastal encroachment policy, the proposed fee schedule, and coastal encroachments. Good afternoon. Thanks for waiting. Director Gaffney. Thank you, and I always like to be squeezed in. That sounds like you guys might want lunch, I'm just thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. Chairman, friend, and fellow supervisors, thank you for having me today. Uh, we have a beautiful coastline. I'll try to not speed through this too quickly, but um, lots of tourists come here to enjoy it. Um, our locals come to enjoy their secret little spots. Um, as you can see highlighted by this picture here, um, not exactly looking like a heavily developed area, but still legal places for people to park and illegal access at the end of the court here. Um, so that is what we would like to see, places where people can come enjoy and access our beaches and, and enjoy that in a managed way. Um, as we look around, there are some places that aren't so well managed, um, and unfortunately one of these places are, are county parks or county park accesses. So. What we have here is an area, you can see the garbage cans to the left, you can see poor maintenance done on our part, you can see weeds growing into an area where people might normally be able to park or we might be able to put a picnic table. Um, so what ends up happening is as a result of our own deferred maintenance items, as a lack of funding over the years, as issues arise, uh, inattention to areas like this, um, often unintentionally, uh, owners of the properties adjacent to our easement and or our public property will encroach on it. Uh, they'll encroach on it whether it's a flower bed or it's landscaping or sometimes a fence gets built in the wrong place and then 15 years goes by and another fence is built and so we end up having places where um, the encroachment is pretty significant. Uh, what we're looking to do is change that to make it more structured, to provide a structure in place that people will understand. Um, they'll have a process, they can come forward. Um, we have a policy. As you recall, this all started almost a year ago uh, when we, we came to you and mentioned this issue. You pushed it forward uh, for us, a resolution to give uh, the Parks Department the authority to deal with this issue. I think one of the areas that was highlighted or a concern at the time is this area at the end of Rockview. You can see where the red dotted line is, is actually the public easement. That's actually with a walkway. And over the course of time, you can see in between the red line and the yellow line where the neighbors um, had allowed their landscaping, um, whether it's the owners that are currently residing there or have been previous owners of these properties. Um, and there's a fence with a seawall. And so that entire public access area was lost. Um, so this area has since been dealt with, but it took a, a lot more probably complication, a lot more consternation and effort than needed to uh, if we'd had a, a, an appropriate policy in place. And we're currently working with uh, the Coastal Commission right now to finish out the area over the, where, where the red dot is and the two cars are parked as a result of some of the mitigation as you probably are aware, there can be fines levied. Um, there's some issues that can arise with coastal that are more significant than something we're looking at here. Um, we'd like to work um, closely with coastal. We, I have in the last year spent uh, working with coastal and uh, county council and our uh, chief of real property to develop the policy that you have before you today. So what I'm asking for is your approval to give us um, this policy that will provide structure. Um, it will provide a modest stream of income that we'll be able to use to develop these areas. Um, it won't be something that we're gonna go out and actively pursue people and, and look for violations that are occurring. It's gonna be a passive implementation. It's gonna go along with a lot of projects that are already occurring. We already have encroachments that have been um, on the forefront as a result of whether it's somebody's reported it or there's been a violation or it's been brought to our attention by Coastal. So we would work over the next year with Coastal 
um, to ensure that the policy we have fits within the confines of what they're thinking. Uh, keep in mind, we don't want to interfere with anything that um, maybe it's a coastal development permit or there's other issues that they may have. We want to make sure we're working collaboratively with them. And we're, we would like to spend the next year rolling out the policy that we're presenting and, and giving all of our residents um, the opportunity to um, understand it, come forward, and be included in the policy. And at that point, a year from now, actually July 1st, 2019, if you weren't part of the, you weren't part of the program, part of the encroachment program, you would be asked to uh, either abate your encroachment, meaning we would ask you to remove any structures or landscaping um, immediately, and or there might be fines that could be levied against you at that time. So this gives everybody the opportunity to step forward. It kind of moves things forward in a passive way. The other portion of this that um, I'll just quickly explain is that if you look here in this picture where the red arrows are pointing to the yellow line where the actual property easement is, that might be actually a nice benefit for everybody. We, you know, whether it's um, having a, a nice area for people to enter into a public access or if there's no public access there, but um, maybe eventually we're looking at that, whether we'd make a decision to add parking there or whether or not we allow them to, in, for lack of a better term, rent the space back from us annually. The rental back from us annually would be the income stream we'd be seeing. And if we make the decision to uh, remove that landscaping there, there's other locations that would also be able to uh, add to the income stream to help us maintain that. So we developed um, three trust funds that are in the three supervisorial districts um, that any of the money that's recovered through this process would go right back into those trust funds and would go immediately to the maintenance and or operations of these coastal areas and these coastal access points. Uh, I'm, I'm abbreviating the presentation significantly just so um, I know I've spoken with each of you and I also want to make sure the public's had an opportunity to hear. I'm sure you all have questions. Um, but that generally is what we're looking for, is to provide beautiful coastal access and make sure that it doesn't cost any money for the general fund. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. I think it's uh, important to move forward with this policy. A couple uh, of things that I'd like to see. You know, I, I think it's a good idea to have a, a report back in a year so we have an idea of what's going on, your conversations with the Coastal Commission staff. But I also think you need to work with the uh, Department of Public Works um, because in, um, in my experience in the first district, uh, when the Coastal Commission has come to deal with some encroachments, um, it seems like, oh, we'll just clear that out and everything will work fine, but it has an impact on drainage and, and a lot of other pieces. And so there has to be coordination um, uh, in the removal of any encroachment. There are, there are needed, so that would be great to see um, is that you work with them. Um, the other thing which wasn't exactly clear to me, and I think um, it would be helpful to, uh, when you come back to, to maybe define this in some way, is where this policy is going to be in place. Um, because we have encroachments all over the place. Um, some are in coastal areas, some aren't in coastal areas. Um, I'm sure the parks is not taking on uh, all encroachments, and so it would be good to, to have a, a sense of uh, where that's going to be. Um, and then I, I don't know whether it's explicitly stated, but I think it should be, um, and uh, as we look at this, is that we have the right at any time to, to take back the public land for the public. Um, and uh, there may be times where we don't need the land and we're willing to rent it or lease it back to, to the property owner, but we should assert our right um, as strongly as possible um, and uh, not cede any of that um, uh, uh, or give the impression that somehow you could just be bought. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, we may not need at the end of 21st Avenue land right now, but we may want it, and I don't want the expectation, of, oh, I've been renting it for five years, so now I get to have it. That's not the way it works. Absolutely. It isn't a rent to own type deal. Yes, and, and Coastal feels strongly about that same idea as well. Yeah, and so uh, uh, maybe when we come back, I just want to add a couple things to see in a report back. Are there any other questions or comments before we move it to the community? Supervisor Caput? You bet. Uh, thank you uh, for the report. And I, I guess mine was the same uh, that 
we don't, uh, if they have to pay something, what, to keep it in place, uh, that doesn't bring up an adverse possession type of a question where they're um, occupying it, so, so to speak, uh, and then also paying for taxes and all that. So there's no problem there, right? As a matter of law, it's actually not possible to acquire public property by adverse possession. So it's ex you can do that with your neighbor's property when it's private property, but when it's publicly owned, it's not possible to acquire it. It's not possible to yeah, do that. Yeah, but we, we do include that language in all of our right. encroachment permits as well. Yeah, because I don't want to give up any right also. <clears throat> and I guess my biggest concern is uh, we all pay taxes, and then some people uh, live actually on the coast, and they they do what, uh, what you're talking about, but uh, we're... The poor people, the middle class, everybody is paying for all the roads that go to their home, all the roads that go to the beach and all that. And for somebody to actually make it harder for uh, a taxpayer to actually access the beach, uh, there's something wrong there. But some of them are not really intentional, like the picture before this, uh, that, that could have just happened over time. So. I mean, I'm not blaming everybody for trying to intentionally block access, but some are clearly trying to do that. And I'm just going to mention it. Uh, it's kind of related to putting up a gate and uh, requiring a key to enter a community to access the beach. But that, that's, a, that's a bigger problem down the line, and that's something we're going to have to deal with sooner or later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just glad that we're addressing this. It's vitally important not only to our county residents, but those who come to visit us, and they're so important to our economy. I think it is really uh, a good good uh, step forward, and um, I, I look forward to you coming back and seeing how it's uh, developing as we move along. But thank you very much. It's good we address this finally. Thank you. We'll now open it up to the community. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board supervisor. Uh, real, real quick, to uh, uh, the coastal zone, right? There, <coughs> almost all of these are on the coastal zone. This is all the coastal zone only. Definitely, yes. Well, we, I'll okay. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold? Uh, so I would move the recommended actions and ask for a report back uh, at this time uh, next year. Uh, and the. It would be in that report back. It would be good to have information about how you work with the Coastal Commission staff and DPW um, uh, to, uh, about the issues of encroachment permits and how that all works together. To have some idea of where this policy will apply to, um, that uh, and that we find a way to you know express that pretty straightforward right that we get that encroachment we get to we we get to decide. Um, when uh, we want our encroachment area back, not somebody else. Okay. A motion from Supervisor Leopold. I'll a second. A second from, uh, actually, Supervisor McPherson had already seconded it, but all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. It passes unanimously. We will uh, take our lunch break. We'll come back at 145. I know we have 130 scheduled item, but it's a uh, study session, so we'll just push it to 145 for Public Works. Give everybody an opportunity. We also take closed session after the 145 uh. item. Jeff. Eighty-seven, which is to conduct a study session on the proposed 2018-19 capital improvement program and direct public works to present a final 2018-2019 capital improvement program incorporating all changes that the board adopts as part of the 2018-19 budget hearings in capital improvement program related budget appropriations on or before December 12th of 2018 as outlined in the memo of the interim director of public works uh, online you can see the capital improvement program and we'll start uh, welcome back Mr. Machado good afternoon chair uh, supervisors thank you for the uh, the detailed introduction you almost took all my words out of my mouth but I will cover it briefly uh, your board accepted and filed the proposed CIP on May 22nd with direction to return to your board today for a study session. In addition, county staff held a study session with the Planning Commission on May 23rd. The department did not receive any substantial feedback from the commissioners that required any changes to the current CIP booklet. The annual CIP cycle requires staff to return to your board in December with the final <laughs> CIP. 
This year's CIP is a five-year planning document outlining the financing of the program capital improvement projects for roads, roadside, drainage, parks, safety facilities, and county facility improvements in each planning area. The formatting of this document has been updated for the 2018 version and will continue to be improved with each CIP cycle. Today's study session is your opportunity to ask questions about the CIP document, individual projects, and the financing of the improvements. At the end of the study session, it is recommended that your board direct the Department of Public Works to present the final CIP to your board on or before December 12, 2018. The final CIP will incorporate any changes made to this CIP, CIP related uh, to budgets. Uh, staff is here and available to respond to your questions, and I, do, I did want to uh, thank uh, Amy Miyakusu for doing such a great job. You'll notice it's a new format. It's, uh, it's much easier to read. It's uh, very inclusive. And so I want to thank her for quarterbacking it, bringing it together, formatting it, making it look as good as it does, and be as complete as it is. So with that, turn it to your board for any questions. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Also, thank you for the formatting. There's absolutely no question that this is uh, uh, superior to anything we've had in history here as a CIP. <laughs> it's been a, uh, a uh, priority of the board to have something that was also accessible, not just for the board, but also for the community as well. And I think this is very easy by district for people to see what projects there are. I'll open up the board for questions. Uh, would like to start? Supervisor Kennedy? No? Okay. Supervisor Le Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for, for the presentation and thank you for the work on uh, this document. It is a lot better um, in helping us figure out what projects are, are on tap when they're going to be done and, and what we might be able to expect. Um, I was really excited earlier today when we, um, uh, when we uh, approved the acceptance of fund for Granite Creek and North Branch of Forty because uh, th those are very well needed. Um, one thing that's not in this, and I know you, we've talked uh, with your staff, is recently the board approved uh, the, the uh, positioning of a new uh, street light or uh, um, traffic light uh, at Robertson, and I want to make sure that in our December update of this that that uh, project is in the book or included as an addenda because uh, the board supported that. Um, the big question to me, well, I have a couple of questions, is we, um, now that we have this document in a, in a way that understands, and uh, I, I want to make sure that we sync it up with our other planning processes that we do. So we've, we've done the sustainable Santa Cruz County uh, plan. Uh, we participate in the bigger AMBAG uh, planning. But it seems to me that we need to be thinking about our infrastructure investments that align with what those plans have to say. Um, because w w if we're envisioning um, uh, increases in densities, we have to make sure that the infrastructure is there. So I'd like to see in the future that, 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 there, that we have a, a, a plan that looks about that expected growth um, and that we start preparing for what infrastructure needs are, are there because uh, I think that will be uh, very helpful. Um, the other thing which uh, it's hard, um, uh, I get asked about a lot, but it's hard to tell in, in just this document, uh, and I've had some conversation with staff about uh, bike infrastructure and where the bike infrastructure is going to be placed, what, what kind of projects those are, what does that look like, and it seems to me it's, it's it's twofold. I know we're, we've, uh, we've recently got an ATP grant in which we're doing a safe route to school. Yes. Um, but I think we need a complete uh, streets plan for our bicycle infrastructure. Right. So we could be working towards that uh, um, yep. every year uh, because we know that there's a lot of interest in the community for uh, uh, sound and safe bike, bike infrastructure to support people who choose to ride bikes. Sure. That that probably goes in line with syncing with the uh, other documents of the region, including the master plan of bicycles, non-motorized master planning. And so great comments, absolutely. Yeah, because I just, I just think it, it could be a better, it, it will be an even better document. Right. And I, I appreciate the work uh, that was done by Amy. Um, and I, uh, it's something that I've uh, 
complained about for a number of years. And now that we have something that actually uh, I think works uh, better, I just want to express my uh, deep appreciation for the work you helped in putting this all together <laughs> to make it uh, so easy to read and for easy for me to share with constituents. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Supervisor Leopold. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I just to look at this, it's very well presented. Thank you, Amy, again, for uh, putting this together so it's understandable. Uh, but one thing that we do have to understand, there is so much to do here, uh, especially in light of our storm of uh, 2016. I uh, see there's an estimated cost of $676 million, and uh, everybody would like to have all of these things done yesterday, but it's going to take a while. And I think uh, your explanation of the, the probably the, the completion date, and some, a lot of them are to be determined. Um, I think that uh, people uh, in Santa Cruz County are going to be excited that we have this plan available and they can see where we're going, but there are going to be some disappointments that why didn't you do this for me this year and not next? Uh, it's sometimes it's, well, it's basically it's we don't have enough money to do it even though we get some state and federal matches on this, but uh, for instance in Lompico there's half a road taken out of there and uh, it's a disaster recovery project literally and that um, requires FEMA to get involved next to the creek and so forth. And so since they're going to pay 75% of it, it's worth the wait. We just can't jump into these things and get them done. So uh, it's going to take some understanding, I think, from the general public of why we're not doing some things right now, because we need to get federal assistance in this case of Lompico Road. Um, but uh, I just think it's um, a, a really a great document for people to easily understand. And uh, I can um, understand uh, the county residents' anxiety, but I hope they also understand that there's going to be a little bit of patience that's going to be required to get these things done. Thank you. Supervisor Caput, anything to add before we open up the community on this? No, I, uh, everything, thank you. I, I Microphone. Well. Microphone. All right. Uh, yeah, most everything was answered and I want to thank you for the work you've put in. Uh, I, I can't recall <laughs> how many of the projects take place in South County and District 4, but you, you have a, a quick summary maybe you can give me. A, does it include the work yard off of uh, Houlihan Road? I don't know. Uh, we can gather that information. I, I, off the top of my no, head, right. I don't okay. know, but we can. That's fine. Pull that together for there you. is a section in the document about District 4 that lists all the projects. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Nothing additional? Okay. Well, this is a study session, but open up to the community. Um, Chair, yes. if, you, if you don't mind, there's one other set of questions I wanted to ask. It was re I realized about parks. Okay. Um, uh, well, I've, I've spoken to Mr. Gaffney uh, before uh, about parks um, and one of the things that's been concerning uh, that I've heard is that uh, from my planning commissioner is that there are projects whose mitigation include the planting of trees in which money is, is going to go to parks to plant trees. And then I also know that there was a former redevelopment project right there on, um, uh, on East Cliff Drive right by 30th in which we were going to do a three for one replacement that hasn't happened and there were some reasons why that hasn't happened. But I'm wondering if we can if we can get some uh, uh, greater information or a better timeline as to when those projects, those trees, might be planted. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, we accepted those funds in 2006. They were required as a development in 2003. Their, um, accepted those funds, I'm sorry. It was about $6,000 from three different property owners. And we were supposed to plant three to one, as you said. However, uh, several issues came up, one of which was a butterfly mitigation plan and then a master plan around that. Um, we recently acquired some land down the Moran Lake area where that has occurred. 
So that now actually has allowed us to do a complete master plan for the whole area. And so it's unfortunate, but it will take us longer because we're going to need to complete that first. Otherwise, planting a few trees in one location as part of it might be counter to what the entire plan for the area is. It just ties in, unfortunately, to that. The good news is that we have the, the Prop 68 money, and we will be able to now do a full CEQA document for the entire area, and that will allow us to apply for very large grants to redo the entire Moran Lake area. So that $6,000 won't go to waste, but we're going to be seeing significant funds beyond that that will be able to do the completion of the project. So I think it makes total sense to wait for the complete planning to be done, but we still have that money in some account somewhere. Absolutely, so yes. When the time comes, we can say we're ready to plant the trees, we have the resources. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, well, uh, I, 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 that, um, uh, uh, I will look forward to getting updates then about that um, uh, that project I will give and the planning for it. And, uh, the, you know, when I think, uh, you know, how tall the tree would be yeah. uh, if we had planted it in 2006 to when we'll actually plant it, just missed opportunities. That isn't on you. No, I agree. We do it right, but it, but but it, we we shouldn't let these opportunities go away. No, I agree. And Supervisor Caput has a good plan. He goes out and plants redwood all, trees all the time, as I understand it. So maybe it we should follow his lead. Yeah. At the parks you department. You don't want me to plant eucalyptus. So. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> That's a little tricky. Non-natives are not good. Yeah. Oh yes, sir. And real briefly, uh, uh, Director Gaffney, on as we start to accumulate um, more beach access points that are managed by parks that will need. Um, larger maintenance, are they going to be folded into the CIP moving forward, such as possibly one in my district that will be relatively large? Um, is that something that we're actually going to build into the CIP formally? That's absolutely what we're going to do, yes. Okay. And in regards to uh, Seacliff Village Park Phase 2, I see that, you, that the intention this year is to actually try and come up with what we're actually going to do in Phase 2. I mean, we have a plan, but to actually do what's, what's reasonable or feasible there and then work from there on to actually creating a budget, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and related to that, you know, uh, eucalyptus trees are non-native, uh, but as you know by Moran Lake, they're imported Very by the important. butterfly habitat, so we probably shouldn't call them invasive species in the document yes. it does. It's one uh, of those strange situations you don't see often where non-native actually is supporting a native species, so that's it's very unusual. Well, it would be great in our documents if we didn't just call them invasive species. I'll work on that. Butterfly habitat, so. Okay, that's a good idea. A less judgmental document, please, <laughs> Mr. Gaffney. Uh, We're in Santa Cruz. The tree has a heart, man. We're inclusive. Yes. Give I'm it, the Lorax. I give speak it, for the trees. Some, that's right. Give it a soul. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the proposed 2018-19 CIP? This is your opportunity during this study session. Good afternoon. Welcome, Ms. Strauss. Good afternoon. My name is Yannicka Strauss. I'm the executive director of Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, Bike Santa Cruz County endorsed Measure D in 2016 for the huge opportunity that it would provide to make bicycle improvements on our neighborhood roads. And in this proposed 2018-2019 budget, it shows that Measure D funding, funds will be allocated to resurfacing programs, a resurfacing program in each district. Resurfacing roads is a huge benefit to bicyclists, it, and it also provides a huge opportunity to um, to improve bicycle amenities when restriping. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has done this successfully and, and should be a model that we look at. Um, bike Santa Cruz County urges you to direct staff to um, add bike lanes, sharrows, and green lane treatments whenever possible when resurfacing and restriping. Um, additionally, we encourage you to support staff in their grant application for the active transportation plan for the whole county. This will provide a priority, priority list for staff, but will also help uh, staff to acquire grant funds to, um, to fund these new projects. Um, lastly, the Regional Transportation Commission's Bicycle Advisory Committee also supports this recommendation. So thank you for supporting um, improving bicycle safety in the county. Thank you. Is there anybody else like to address us during this study session? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, it's just a direction situation. Supervisor Leopold? Yeah, well, uh, I, if, it, if our, one of our uh, uh, recommended actions is to accept this, uh, I would make that motion. I would also ask that, that, um, that Public Works come back with us with a list of the pavement management projects that, that we're going to be doing this year and what kind of bike um, 
infrastructure or striping that we're going to be doing as part of that as an informational item. Okay. Just be good, good for us to, to know what's already going to be happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the comments from our last speaker are good to, to think about, you know, long term, especially as we do a, a complete streets plan that really looks at what we need for um, our, uh, to make biking safe, safer in Santa Cruz County. That's great. There's a motion. Second. Okay, do we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We will uh, end the regular meeting and go into closed session. Will there, there be anything reportable at a closed session? No. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on our closed session item? Okay, seeing none, we'd like to thank Community TV for covering today and that'll adjourn the regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors.